Okay, it looks like we are good to go. Everybody is just Okay, I will go ahead and begin. Good afternoon, welcome to our 4 o'clock p.m. January 18th, 2022 study session of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsanity.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please also note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is your time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand when it is your time to speak. And I would like to ask the clerk to call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Present. Mayor Fisher is currently absent. Coming? Yep. Brown? Here. Myers? Here. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. Mayor Bernard? Present. Okay. Our only agenda item today is a study session on the Climate Action Plan 2030 target setting study session. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. First, for order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from City Council. We will then take any public comment and then return to Council for further feedback. And with that, I'd like to introduce the Wise Web Sustainability and Climate Action Manager presentation. I welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Tiffany Wise Web Sustainability and Climate Action Manager out of the City Manager's Office. Um, I do also have here today to assist with any questions that uh, you might have that are maybe beyond what I can answer. Um, members of our for a consultant team uh, that on, and that would be uh, Camila Bobrov and Ryan Gardner are also uh, them on the line. And I'm going to go ahead then and share my screen. Okay, I believe you can see my screen at this point. Yes, okay, and seeing heads nod, yes, wonderful. Okay, just want to start off with support land acknowledgement um, that I, as many of you are likely working from the lands of the Owasa Sea Tribe. Um, and those lands are now being supported by the Amamas Land Trust. Okay, uh, before we jump into things, I just wanted to review the um, goal of the overarching climate action plan development process, which is called Resilient Together. You can see our logo in the upper right-hand corner. And that is number one, to prepare a qualified cap state targets and we're going to talk a lot more about what that means a bit later on and also determining the year and the most equitable path to carbon neutrality I should say that equity is of paramount uh, value to this planning process and the outcomes that result and you're going to hear more about that as well um, the objectives of this specific study session today um, and I'd like to provide to you first of all update on the plan development progress and so forth that we have conducted and then I'll take a short break to see if you have any questions on that process before we dive into the real meat of this study session which is to discuss considerations of various potential 
potential emissions reduction target for the plan itself. Before I get started on the process um, that we have embarked upon uh, thus far, I do want to take a moment to really emphasize and, and regroup us on the reason why we're, we are really um, undertaking this very important process. And that is because carbon dioxide is at an all-time high. I'm achieving global warming at about 1.2 degrees Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit to date. And should we surpass 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is projected to occur between 2030 and 2040, there will be irreversible tipping points in our climate and cities will bear the brunt of this. We know this is caused from carbon dioxide, from fossil fuel combustion and methane or natural gas. That is an important level of natural gas. Um, as you have acknowledged previous um, resolutions that you've adopted, number one, declaring a climate emergency, number two, supporting a Paris climate agreement, number three, supporting a Green New Deal, we know that it's very important to adopt as aggressive targets as we can manage. But as you will learn today, there are realities of this massive community-wide change management that we must undertake that will require many hundreds of millions of dollars. <clears throat> oh, one other thing on this before I move on from this. One thing to keep in context is talk about the cost of investment that we require. It's actually the social cost of carbon coming more and more included into um, climate planning. For the amount of emissions that we as a city community-wide each year, we are experiencing between 14 and $25 million in impact to our community. These are impacts through rising health care costs, destruction of property, free food prices, and more. So these are the this is the economic harm from those impacts. And that's something to keep in mind when we talk about the cost it will take um, for us to meet our share um, of emissions reduction necessary. So to start out here, um, our climate action plan process really can be simplified down to these core components the values, vision, goals, and targets, measures, which are the high-level um, uh, types of activities that need to take place in order to reach our goals and targets, the actions, which are the policies, programs, the uh, infrastructure um, that will need to take place, and all of that then wraps climate action plan, which will include a funding and implementation plan, both municipally and community-wide. Now, this is the simplified. I'm also going to share with you kind of a, a bigger flow chart here um, that really shows us what we're going to be focusing on here today, which is um, the emissions targets through the emissions reduction actions. But before we move on to that, I do want to orientate you to, um, you know, where we where we are in this process. Started this April of last year. We've had two major community engagements um, since then that have helped us establish values and vision for this climate action plan. We have been an iterative process uh, over the past several months in determining our uh, emissions targets as well as community goals. You will learn that there are other areas that our community values around climate restoration and climate economy that fall outside equal qualified climate action plans, emission reduction measures and actions. Um, so in addition to the goals and targets, as I mentioned, we have high level measures, uh, both emission reduction, climate economy, which will revolve around things that are a lot of things that are um, under less uh, operational control by the city. Those relate to green jobs, uh, the embedded carbon consumption, online ordering, those kinds of things, and diet, as well as climate restoration measures. 
which include things like carbon sequestration of regenerative landscapes and urban forests. We also have been iteratively developing an equity screening that we've applied to the measures and to the actions, again, with a specific policy program. And you can see we have a little loop going on because this is an iterative process. As I mentioned, all of this will be bundled into the Climate Action Plan, um, including funding and implementation plan. But for today, we really are focusing on the emissions reduction targets, the emissions reduction measures, and we'll be touching briefly on the act as well. So our engagement so far as started in April of last year, we've had two major engagements around visioning and goal setting, um, where we had a variety of different ways, both virtual and live, that folks could um, engage in this process. Um, we have been conducting small group meetings with transportation agencies, unsheltered folks, um, uh, BIPOC folks, um, as well as a number of other um, groups to ground truth what we're hearing in our broader uh, engagement. And through these two engagements, we really have begun to establish an initial community value and a set of uh, values. And really, relatively, what we've heard from our community is that they really are seeking an aspirational and equitable climate that's grounded in science. And that's going to be a very important point that I'm going to continue to return to. And so just, I really don't want to read things up, but I think the vision is important enough to do so. Uh, our community seeks to rapidly enact climate solutions that support and enhance an equitable community with robust, active, and public transportation, plentiful housing that's affordable, sustainable, and resilient, and regenerative landscape. And the values really revolve around equity, people-centric transportation, efficient and low to no carbon, buildings, energy, and water, the protection and enhancement of natural resources in urban parks, and the elimination of waste and supporting local We also have been developing this FP screening tool um, over these past few months. Um, these screening areas you can see in the yellow box on the left-hand side, they really um, span a wide range of considerations for equity. And you can see also on the screen a couple different exercises that we have um, utilized to help us to provide some equity about, or evaluation of equity with respect to developing the values and vision as well as our measures. And we did that through our Climate Action Task Force and our Equity Advisor have about a dozen folks um, from different historically underrepresented and underserved groups that come in and out of our project. And uh, we have uh, compiled uh, some equity considerations uh, for various measures. And then we've gone into the community um, with these small groups I've mentioned, the unsheltered folks, and NAACP, uh, youth to really ground to what we are hearing. That was for the values, vision, and measures. But then, and this is what we learned, um, is that there are a number of equity considerations around our major emissions reduction areas or measures that really revolve around affordability and accessibility. And I'm not going to read these all in and uh, we can certainly come back to them. But these were the initial set of equity considerations that came out of those exercises I just showed you. From there, we refined this equity screening tool that we have just applied to our access and the public program infrastructure that we specify to reach these uh, emissions reduction measures and targets. And what our screening tool looks like is that across all 
different screening areas that you go to, um, accessibility, affordability, just stop, and so forth. We had a series of questions, 22 questions. And we asked, is action according to these different screening areas beneficial, neutral, or harmful frontline low-income communities or communities of color? And if an action in the scoring process, each action has about 22 questions that we ask and we score, plus, zero, minus. And one of our guiding principles is if any action does cause harm or gets a negative score, it must be revised or must complementary action that mitigates that harm, meaning we will not accept any negative. And so just to give you an example of that, for example, if we call for, say, uh, building electric, that we know some cost that gets passed on to a homeowner. That neg that could be a negative score because it could have a negative impact on equity. A complementary action would be ensuring that there are rebates or incentives for low-income folks. And that would transition that negative score to a zero or to a positive. So that's an example of how an action that would have a complementary action or rewritten to include that incentive. We have just went through with our task force and our equity advisors applying the equity screening tool to all of our actions. There are about a hundred of them and have made initial revisions. So this is where we're going with our engagement process now between now and May. From the value that I just shared with you, we're going to be launching a public dialogue platform on our draft app. You can see a couple of screenshots it's actually from Santa Barbara County using the same platform right now. And this will allow our community to have really robust dialogue on the actions and indicate their level of, of agreement with the actions. We will take, this will be open through the month of February. It will launch. Um, uh, the last week of January, it will be open for about five weeks. Um, close that up, come back. We will take what we learned today at the study session, what we learned from public dialogue platform. We will refine the goal targets that we talk about today. We will refine the actions. We will add in uh, work that our consultants are producing on the funding and implementation planning as well as some internal work we're doing with our various teams. Um, we will conduct more focus groups um, over the month of February, including with um, both folks from the business community, uh, bikers, and uh, others. And then we're going to be coming back to City Council with another, another study session in March with recommendations for the goals and targets, the actions themselves, and the uh, draft. We will then uh, have a webinar in May with the broader community. We tend to have this um, bring higher plan to council uh, the first meeting in August for adoption. So we really are rounding the corner here um, and moving towards completion um, of this project. Really important project. I just want to pause there. Is there any questions on the process? Before we dig into the target setting. Does anybody have anything? I'm trying to scan. I'm not seeing any. Okay, very good. So go ahead and go on forward. I just want to leave some space for that. We're going to be shifting gears here. Okay. All right. So our focus for the rest of um, the time that I'll, I'll be today is really on specifically emissions reduction target setting. And don't know why there's two ones here. It should be a one and a two. But there are two ways to think about it. There is the CEQA qualified climate action plan target, and there is the potential for an or stretch target. The CEQA qualified target can be um, adopted as mass or community-wide. So uh, target, 
a net 280,000 uh, emissions a year, and we're trying to get to X or a target, which divides that overall mass target by our population. We are recommending more support for capita target, qualified cap target, although we're going to discuss what that target actually is. Because the per capita allows us to account for growth, population growth. Um, Councilmember Cummings, I see that you have your hand raised. Do you want me to take your question right now? I just wanted to ask for clarification for the community. Um, you know, we talk about emissions reductions. Are we talking about the city, like in terms of city government's emission reductions? Or are we talking about the entire community as a whole and individuals' reductions along with? The city's reduction. I just want to make sure it's clear when we're talking about climate action plan. Absolutely. Our goal. Thank you for that. And I think the next slide will will definitely clarify that. But it's community wide, so that does include every individual's emissions, every business emissions, um, every uh, all of our municipal operations. So we're talking about community wide. Um, and with respect to two different types of targets. We can adopt one, or we can adopt both. We do, we have, however, committed to adopting a target, of, of producing a CEQA qualified climate action plan. And let me talk a little bit about that before we talk about aspirational or stretch targets. So um, the CEQA qualified climate action plan allows us to produce thresholds by develop need to design their project, design and build their project, and is really one of the strongest levers we have in development. It also allows to streamline the CEQA requirements for those developments that can meet those thresholds. In order to develop a CEQA qualified climate action, we must conduct a in emissions inventory for areas under local influence, which we've done for 2019. You can see on the right hand side our community wide inventory. We also need to identify some production targets that consistent with state goals. We're going to talk about that next. And then we need to monitor our progress of reaching those state goals. If you look on the right hand side of the to the 2019 community-wide emissions inventory. This includes the different sectors, transportation, residential commercial energy, solid waste, wastewater, that are included in what's called the state focus. And so the CEQA qualified cap must only include the measures, sectors rather, that are included in the state focus plan. So you can see this does not include carbon sequestration, for example, of urban forests. The state is considering adding that to the scoping plan, but that has not happened yet. And what you see on the screen here is that 69% of our emissions come from transportation. And that is a revision from what was presented to you um, late last summer in our 2020 closeout report. We realized that the inventory produced by AMBAG did not include Vehicle miles traveled for half trips started and ended, started outside of the city, ended within the city, and those that started within the city and ended outside of the city. Adding those additional um, BMPs bumped our transportation-related emissions from 43% to 69%, the massive, massive area where we need to reduce emissions. Another 26% is in residential and commercial energy, and industrial energy, by the way, is, is bundled up with commercial energy. 7% is solid waste, and a little less than 1% comes from wastewater emissions. About 3% of our community-wide emissions are from municipal operations. So actually, a very small portion of emissions come from our municipal operations. That is operation of um, various city facilities, um, our fleet, uh, for example. 
Tiffany, I just wanted to chime in and ask that going forward, any acronyms spelled out the first time. I think it would be helpful for. Sure, so why don't I, um, why don't I take the two that are on the screen here? One is CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act. And that is the environmental review process that is specified for development. Um, and then uh, THC is greenhouse gas. And I'm trying to consistently use the term emissions and, and not reference THC. But thank you for that. Um, and I will strive to clarify any other acronyms as we go forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so let's talk about what are our get down to the essence. What are our potential emissions reduction targets? As I shared with you from the beginning, there's the potential people qualified targets that need to be legally defensible. So we need to have a set of actions that are reasonable and feasible. And there are aspirational or stretch targets or visions that are voluntary. So two separate targets, we can adopt one or we can adopt both. So starting with the people qualified targets, the potential targets that we might adopt, let's start with Assembly Bill 32, that's AB 32, an 80% reduction by 2050 from 1990 levels. This is from 2006. It was adopted in our 2020 Climate Action Plan. But since that time, the state has adopted through Senate Bill SB 32, a 40% reduction by 2030 from 1990 levels. So an interim kind of target. We have incidentally reduced emissions 9% between 1990 and 2020, we as a community. This SB 32 target highlighted because it is the minimum required for CEQA for us to adopt CEQA qualified cap. It also, as you will see in some future charts, puts us on the path to carbon neutrality by 2045. We can also adopt or in, in addition to or as a replacement to SB 32, something that we're calling SB 32 plus. We can go beyond the 40% reduction, so greater than 40%, if we can demonstrate an, atta an attained feasible act. So we have a couple choices for this equal qualified cap, the SB 32 minimum at a 40% reduction, or SB 32 plus at greater than 40% reduction. And I'm gonna He's going to give you a lot of considerations around this in the next few slides. As far as the aspirational or the stretch target is concerned, which again, we don't have to adopt an aspirational or stretch target. Sorry, yeah. had some dogs turn from a walk. <laughs> um, the aspirational or stretch targets are not legal. They're not our legal targets and they are voluntary. One can be the state carbon neutrality goal, which is set uh, by executive order. And right now that's at 2045. I should mention that the state is considering revising the carbon neutrality target to 2035, although that has. We can also adopt a science-based target, which our science-based target says that we need to reduce by about 61% emissions between 2019 and 2030. So much more aggressive than the SB32. We are, we are not recommending the science-based target because the science-based target is computed um, on a national level and it does not account for the emissions reduction that we in the state of California and we as the city of Santa Cruz have already been very aggressive in making. And then lastly, there is the possibility of other aspirational targets of carbon neutrality by 2035 or as early as 2030. And I will give you some 
considerations around that as we go forward. So two different kinds of targets and different options for targets. Uh, Mr. Member Myers, I see your hand up. I have a quick question, um, Holly. How does something like the buyer enter into our emissions <laughs> calculation? Burns, but about carbon. What does that, does that, does that number fall in all of this? Sure. So thank you for that question. Anything that's related to urban forest um, is, as I said, it's outside of full qualified carbon. So that would not be counted towards um, or against us for that target unless we would revise our and the state would revise its scoping plan to include those emissions sources. So something like that, we know the state's accounting for those types of emissions. Um, that is something that we could bring into, you know, hey, if an event like that happens, do we want to count that towards our aspirational or stretch targets? Um, but right now it is not being accounted for. You're welcome. Okay, so let's continue on. Let's take a look at what our forecast is like over time. So the blue line that, um, on this chart represents a business as usual or a BAU forecast. That is, if nothing at all, what would our emissions be like over time? And what you see is an increase towards 2025, then a bit of a reduction, and then some more increase. And we have this funky bump because of Central Coast Community Energy and the shift they've made in how they're producing electricity. And I'm not going to get into the minutia details of that right now, but that's what causes this bump at 2025 as ramping down by 20 to have 100% renewable energy, which they have committed to do which incidentally is not the same as carbon neutral. Okay? There are still emissions associated with 100% renewable energy. So this is our business as usual, starting over here on the far left side. And all of the emissions are quantified see on the Y axis in terms of metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, that's MPCO2E per person. So that's that per capita that we're looking and um, carbon dioxide um, for all greenhouse gases, one common unit, um, carbon dioxide equivalent. And so you can see we go up, go down a little bit, and then we go up a little bit more. The orange line is our adjusted business as usual forecast. That takes into account state legislation and regulation, things like uh, renewable portfolios, the energy code um, and building code and shows us what kind of reductions do we get from simply the state legislation and regulation alone. And see we do get um, quite a bit of a reduction. And then we want to look at well, what would that minimum required target people qualified to have to fight? And that's where the star is right here. That's the SB 30, Senate Bill 32 a 40% reduction from 2030 by 1990. So you see right at, right at 2030 where the star is. And then if you continue in a linear fashion, you see that we've reached carbon neutrality by 2045. So S32 puts us on a track to carbon neutrality by Uh, minimum that 40% reduction from 2030 from 1990. Well, we have a bevy of climate action plan measures. So these are the high level measures, not the actions, not, they're not the specific policies and programs, but they're the high level measures will take for us to reach those targets. And as you can see, they revolve around active transportation, electric vehicles, and public transit electric buildings and renewable energy, water really comes down to energy 
methods and waste production. And we are showing carbon sequestration on the upper right-hand corner, even though it is outside of the people qualified cap, but it's under consideration by the state to bring it into the state scoping and in the future. So it is something that we're quantifying, putting actions around. So when people refine to what these measures look like, share with what, what that looks like. We held working meetings with department heads, different divisions within the city, other stakeholder groups like our uh, transportation agencies that are responsible for these measures and their implementation because we wanted to understand, you know, what is ambitious but possible in terms of meeting different um, areas like transportation. We developed a suite of actions and measures that exceed the state minimum, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. And let me assure you that these are aggressive, yet feasible, implementable, and defensible. And it's very important to remember that implementable actions are a key requirement for a CEQA qualified staff. So let's get into those. Let's start with building energy reduction measures. So this is where we utilize the tools that we have, dial in what needs to happen in order to reach that SB32 minimum. So we're just talking about the minimum. We're going to get to the, those structures. So this is where we have to, uh, this is 26% of our emissions, just as a reminder, in the building energy. In order to reach the SB32 minimum, we've determined that we need to reduce natural gas usage by 33% residential buildings, by 30% commercial buildings, and that we will have to do so at time of replacement. So when a water heater burns out, um, we would have that, that would replace an electric water heater. And we do assume there's some non-compliance associated with that. We know that not everyone comes to get a permit like to for these different appliances. In terms of the cost to do this, we are looking at about $120 million in total for our community to reach this 33% reduction in residential and 30% in commercial. What does that mean per dwelling unit or per home? It depends on the home type um, and what systems they have, but that could range between $5,000 and $30,000 per dwelling unit. And that's without rebate. I think it's important to know that we have existing rebates from Central, Central Coast uh, Community Energy, and we will continue to need those rebates at each level in order to make this happen, particularly in equitable fashion. Um, the one other thing I want to mention on this is that we also have right now a project that is happening concurrent to the Climate Action Plan development project to develop our roadmap for what green electrification should look like in the city, what policies we need to adopt, um, what investments do we need to make. And that is um, being done uh, as part of a Rocky Mountain Institute uh, project. We have the NAACP as our equity partner. And that will also be complete by July. Um, Councilmember Boulder, I have your hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, so I just have a question. When looking at this through an equity lens, I'm thinking how much more expensive it is to run an electric appliance versus a gas appliance in terms of like a dryer or a water heater. And then there's actually some appliances that just don't come in electric models yet. And so has there been any talk um, statewide you know, in your in your energy circles about how to address those issues? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the state does not allow any quote unquote codes that go on building go beyond the building code to come into effect that are not considered cost effective. So cost effective is it has to be um, demonstrated in order for us to adopt anything, and that is obviously. Some of these rebates come in, but also we get energy rates. And that is something that we're studying as part of this um, project that we have going on parallel to the Climate Action Plan. And I don't have um, 
answers for exactly how that will unfold at this moment, but that is all for Thank you for that question. Okay, so what kind of acts then do we need to take to reach these reductions in building energy? Well, you all know that in 2020, um, a prior council, some of you were on the council, adopted a national gas prohibition in new buildings. So that's already in place. We will need to continue enforcement of that uh, ordinance. But we will also need to pass an existing building electrification ordinance prohibiting new gas equipment in the city by 2024 in order to reach these reductions. And um, this would only be for appliances for which there are readily available electric alternatives. So obviously requiring that does exist already. Um, we will need more staff to enforce compliance with both of these ordinances. And we will need to co-develop a tariff on the finance program with Central Coast um, energy, uh, Community Energy in order for folks to be able to finance this, as well as the access rebates that um, will be available in order to make this transition happen. Um, so this really prohibits any new gas appliances from being installed. Many jurisdictions are looking at this, but this has not been done yet. Um, but this is what we'll like to need to happen. So let's move on to transportation, give you a feel. And again, we're, we're looking at what is it going to take to meet, meet the SB32 minimum, and we will be slightly. You will see that um, we need to bump up our transportation mode share, so that's biking and pedestrian, or walking rather, from 19.5% to 25%. We um, expect that can feasibly increase mode share on public transportation by 1% from 7 to 8%, and that's assuming no rail through 2030. Um, that area, I love to see um, coordination and, and cooperation where that could increase, but that's what's reasonably feasible. We also need to see an increase um, from a little less than 5% mode share for electric vehicles to 35% of passenger vehicles and 25% of commercial vehicles. And on the commercial vehicle side, we really need to focus in on commercial fleets, like you know, um, uh, car sharing, uh, or not car sharing, um, things like Uber Lyft, um, things like U-Haul, our own, that is where there are a lot of options. And we also need to focus on medium and heavy uh, put out more emissions than lighter duty commercial vehicles. We also will need to decarbonize or electrify 50% of our off-road equipment, and that is things that are that includes things like landscaping equipment, construction equipment, and so forth. Now, um, uh, recently there was a state regulation adopted that will require only electric leaf blowers in 2024. So that's going to help us to achieve that 50% reduction. In terms of cost struggles, um, I think you all know that the city, you know, bolstered by grants, really bears the, the most of active transportation infrastructure costs. Public transit is going to require part cooperation and major grant investments. And we've estimated all of these estimates, you, by the way, are high level order of magnitude estimates. We are going to be coming back with our funding and implementation plan with more refined estimates. But community-wide, in terms of electric vehicle adoption and the charging infrastructure investment that we're looking at is over half a billion dollars. And again, this is to meet the S32 minimum. We know that for residential electric vehicles, you know, depending on whether they're used or new, we're looking at between five and thirty thousand dollars in investment, which, by the way, are already Stated and in fact have tier income rebates um, or tiered rebates based on income, um, and those will need to continue and be increased. And we know that commercial EV investments can exceed hundred thousand dollars, depending on what the vehicle is. Um, you know, if it's a, a medium duty truck, uh, it could be around hundred thousand. But as we know, um, uh, electric refuse trucks 
or heavy duty are on the order of you know, almost a million dollars. So um, big investment in the transportation sector, which again represents 69% of our overall. So what does that look like um, in terms of actions? Again, the specific policy program structure, it's about 1,200 new EV chargers. We currently have about 16 public chargers that the city owns and then a number across um, private sector. That's going to have to ramp up significantly. We also will need to require residential renters and rental community, uh, commercial building owners to install working chargers. 20% of parking spaces. We will need right now require electric ready and I think it's a couple spots per, not sure offhand, but it's the second jump. We also are going to need to reduce the number of vehicles in high traffic zones or on other tra uh, transit options available, potentially implementing a congestion charge that applies to passenger cars and car sharing services obviously with exceptions for um, differently abled drivers and um, residents of those areas. We also will need to significantly focus on teleworking and evaluate end use to make sure that we have land available in zone to keep people working in town. And that gets at that additional 26% of emissions that result from trips that start or end in the but go outside of as well. In terms of waste and wastewater reduction measures, again, this is 8% of our overall emissions. We need to, we will need to reduce um, our organic waste 85% by 2030. We do, uh, your council just approved um, the plan for SP 1383, which is the food waste uh, program, which will get us 75% reduction in organic waste but we will need to go further, um, in this case, likely regional solution to get at that other percent that we reduce by 2030. We need a 35% reduction in organic waste, and we're showing zero reduction in wastewater treatment plant process emissions because we recognize that the unit treatment process water treatment plant are tens of millions of dollars cumulatively hundreds of millions of dollars that are very difficult to change out. And if we implement the measure reductions that I've showed you, we can get to S2 without touching wastewater process emissions. So um, I'm sure that I hit all of that. And so some of the, the key actions then is to implement an organic waste beyond the food waste program and heavy I think getting to you know people's choices in the waste that they produce. So in sum, S pretty minimum for a CEQA qualified cap requires a reduction for the per capita emissions from 4.2 to 3.7 metric tons per person by 2030. It requires a $750 million investment about of magnitude community wide by 2030, and will require ramped up municipal staffing and investment by 20, which we estimate to exceed $50 million for us in the municipality. So, if we implement those measures as I, at the percentages I just described, that's the threat right here that I'm showing. The green line is the SB32 target where the star is. And you can see that the red line is below the green line, which means that what I've just laid out would exceed the S32 minimum uh, emissions reduction target that we need for the qualified cap. However, can we be more aggressive with what we're calling S32 plus? And yes, we can be more aggressive but this would require even more aggressive action. And here's some samples of what that might look like. Might require replacement of natural gas appliances before the end of their useful life through a mandatory ordinance. And it's important to remember that the city itself has just made investments in really efficient, but nonetheless natural gas infrastructure and equipment at the city that is expected its useful life and uh, on some of this equipment could extend out to 2035 or even 2040. 
We would also need to increase the cost of driving, single occupants, gas, all taxes, parking fees. We would need to institute other zero emission vehicle areas in the city and ban cars in traffic zones to increase public and active transportation, public and active transportation. And we would need to set a date for natural gas shutoff citywide. Um, the thing to remember though, is to adopt an SC32 plus target, we must be able to achieve real reductions to be legally defensible. And things to think of, other things to think about with this is that, you know, the city as a municipality, as a municipality, some of our stretch goals move into that, is that we lack operational control of places about driving. We can make the infrastructure, we can, you know, but the policies themselves have to come from, or, or rather the choices themselves have to come from our and there are also equity impacts accelerating all the numbers I showed you. Um, they will increase if we if we uh, pursue an SB32 as a people qualified target. And by squeezing all of that to, you know, a 2030 um, year, there it's possible that we're not going to be able to provide the incentives that are needed to make this transition possible for lower income folks folks that are historically underrepresented or underserved. Um, and we really need that financial support. So SB32 plus is possible. There are some real considerations with that for a CEQA qualified cap. Let's look at what some of these other targets might look like. So what we have again on the screen here, is the blue line is business as usual. The orange line is the business as usual adjusted forecast for uh, California regulation. The uh, gray line is that SB32 minimum that we just looked at. We also show a linear reduction um, through 2045 as a straight line linear reduction. That's the dark blue line, right? And that could be something that could be a potential stretch goal. It is the um, state target for carbon neutrality. We also looked at the science-based target, which is this green line. The science-based target ends at 2030. However, as I mentioned previously, that is not California specific. Do not recommend adopting that as a target, um, as a stretch target. And then lastly, we show um, and the orange line to 2035. That would be a great reduction uh, to carbon neutrality by 2035. And we could show that same thing to 2030, which is the, um, the aspiration of the climate policy. So let's talk about those a little more. As you can see, there's a big differential between 2045 and 2035 when we're talking about um, uh, an aspirational target here or an aspirational goal. And the ways that we can do that are more aggressive around our areas like building energy, transportation, and so forth. Carbon sequestration, because if the stretch target is outside of the qualified cap or it's voluntary, we can start to think about carbon sequestration. Climate economy, that's where some of these things around diet and food choices come into play. And then future carbon capture technology that maybe doesn't exist right now or isn't on the market right now. So those would be the ways that the things that the levers to get to an earlier stretch part again need to be volunteers who could not adopt a sequel qualified cap with a, a 2035, 2030 carbon neutrality goal because there is no, it's, an, it's a, infeasible to demonstrate how to get. So our positive target approach are to adopt a linear reduction to carbon neutrality by 2045 or establish a visionary or aspirational target to carbon neutrality by 2035 or 2030 with a strong focus on equity where we're leaning in climate restoration and economy me measures, which again are outside the people qualified cap. We focus our acceleration on municipally that under the areas of control that we do have. 
And also, we would ask council to facilitate or enable us to innovate and pursue next new technologies and opportunities. And we would have the need just to address equity as a rise. We also, from not coming with a recommendation, this is what is up for discussion. But we are recommending that we go from updating the climate action plan every 10 years to every five years to account for new opportunities, new technology, new legislation. Um, that would put us on the same uh, the same uh, frequency or cycle as our climate adaptation, which gets updated every five years. And by the way, beginning by the next year. And in fact, in our next cycle, like integrated together as very common practice in um, this field of study. One other thing I want to mention on carbon sequestration as a point of caution, however, is that we did take a look at from our recent tree, tree plan and resource analysis that was conducted um, la or adopted last year. We looked at our urban forest, and even if we doubled our urban forest that we have, we would get a very minimal reduction in the um, per capita metric tons a year per carbon of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, it's on the order of 0 0.01 metric tons. And remember, I said we need to reduce from 4.2 to 3.7 for the CEQA qualified cap, which excludes sequestration. So if you bring sequestration into that, thinking about a stretch target, there isn't a ton of potential with existing sequestration um, in our urban space. So what are other jurisdictions doing? And we're almost finished here and, and almost ready to, to discuss all of this. So other jurisdictions have taken a number of different approaches. Many of them have adopted the SB32 minimum target of 40% below 1990 by 2030, and has either said that they would make progress towards carbon neutrality by 2045 or earlier, or in fact have adopted a stretch target or a stretch goal that um, is around 2045, 2035, or 2030. Some jurisdictions have a legal target that exceeds us, so that would be the SB32 plus, but those are jurisdictions that had already made significant progress on the SB32 target prior to, for example, Watsonville. Watsonville adopted their legal target as 80% below 1990 by 2030. However, they have achieved a 40% reduction already by 2030. And remember, we've only achieved a 9% reduction. So there, are a bunch of different flavors here. Some have not adopted qualified cap. We have we have determined that we would like to adopt qualified cap and are working in that um, direction. Finally, I want to talk about. Um, I mentioned Bostonville, and I, I want to talk about the fact that all of this is going to really require um, some across our Monterey Bay. And in fact, we climate practitioners are already doing this. We're working very closely with the county who is developing their climate action plan. They're just starting it right now. Watsonville finished and adopted their plan. And we're all working together right now on building electrification uh, regional workforce development initiative that we are pursuing federal funding you can see here the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has unprecedented funding coming across all of our sectors, and it is going to be incredibly important for us to be able to unlock this funding as a region, and that acknowledging we will be able to compete as a region more so than if we go individually as I do want to say the last thing um, on the stretch target is that, you know, I've shown you a lot of limitations today, but the stretch target does um, allow us to explore um, 
carbon neutrality earlier than the state target of 2045 in anticipation of the state potentially ramping it up. It could also open up funding opportunities for us. And it provides a more conservative approach to keep global warming below that 1.5 Celsius. Although, as we know, we need global collective work um, on that as well. And I just want to say it is okay to have a technical CEQA legal target and an aspirational target, although there, you know, there is potential confusion with that, but a lot of jurisdictions have done that, just recognizing that there are clear funding um, limitations to achieving an aspirational target. With that, I want to conclude by just sharing that we are recruiting the Mayor's Climate Action Task Force right now. Um, I encourage you to visit cityofsantacruz.com forward slash climate action plan to apply. That's a one year term that's monthly and um, it uh, works with the city to develop and implement the climate action plan. And I thank very much our climate, our current, and our past year's climate action task force. They have been involved in this project scoping and the RFP preparation. Um, and I have on the screen here um, the upcoming things that are happening. I should say that the March study session has not been determined exactly when that's going to be yet, but it's going to be somewhere around the second or third week of March. Um, but we have a lot of stuff happening before that. Um, I've mentioned that our community engagement platform and more focus groups are going to be happening through January and February. We've got our task force recruitment ending in February. Um, and in March, come back to the study session on our refined approach to all of this, as well as implementing funding. With that, thank you so much. I know this is a lot of material, and I'd love to hear any questions that you might have, any comments that you might have. This is really meant to be um, the discussion portion um, of So, thank you so much. The portion where I will bring it out to council members for any further questions. I see, uh, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Mayor, yeah. please go ahead. Council member Myers and uh, council member Boulder and Brown. Thank you, Tiffany, for such a great presentation. Um, pretty sobering say the least. Um, so I guess my first question is, you mentioned sort of, you know, in the past, sometimes it's hard for our region to obtain federal and state funds, right? Um, there is success, and I'm, I'm trying to weigh some of these against other needs, like you know, some of the other big infrastructure we have on staff. Um, but Based on the funding and yes, how competitive will be, you know, and is there is there any thought about re, you know, building, for example, regional charging facilities like that, where you're not having every single build business have to build charging Priuses or any way to cut carbon benefit so that you think more collectively around our our county is so compressed. We have one transportation corridor. We have, you know, and I'm, so I'm just curious. Do you think that way with this kind of objective, or do you really have to do one municipality? Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you, Council Member Myers. It is clear. You know, the city of San Francisco does very well on the state level and on the federal level particularly with respect to transportation, but we know that that's going to become more and more competitive with this new funding coming out. And as I mentioned at the end, regional collaboration and cooperation will be essential for us to compete for the magnitude of dollars that we need in order to implement these plans. I will say that Watsonville, City of Santa Cruz, the county, our plans all have we all have 
building energy transportation and waste. How we do so is maybe a little bit different, but we are looking for those synergies across the region. I can't speak necessarily to regional parking facilities, but of course, with respect to transportation, waste, and building energy, there is ongoing activity going right now, which I do think will make us more competitive for these larger populations going to need you know, to gain, you, as you saw, we're talking about a minimum of $750 million likely um, to be able to implement this plan. And, um, you know, we're going to have to be thinking differently about how we access funding. And it's not all going to come from grants either. And, as, and you recognize the great point that I failed to mention is that we already have a couple hundred million dollars of deferred capital that we're, we can't fund right now through our general fund. Um, so that is another very important consideration is how does how does this work, you know, stack up? And some of that's overlapping, but some of it is different. And those are the difficult choices, you know, that we're, we're going to need to make going forward. And my, my only other question, thank you. Um, yeah, I was thinking like regional, like the places where people pull in, there's more of a regional charging facility, you know, not so much like they're going to park there all day, but like, Moving back and forth across the county is so. I guess my other question is, um, you know, I think about the our development pattern and the you know the downtown sort of the sense pattern that we know is going to occur over the next few years, okay, over the next decade, with really that focus, quite a lot of focus on housing. Um, I would imagine if someone. So how do you calculate if someone came downtown, you know, or where they are now, how do you how do you make those assumptions about where they may travel for work or school or other things? I mean, is there kind of calculation that's developed? So I'm just curious, like maybe a family, a couple of families who are living in Live Oak or other places up and down, mm -hmm. whatever, they're able to get into one of these, whether it's whatever level of affordability or market rate or what have you move downtown city or they were county or what have you how did they how do you how do you measure that that how does that get done yeah thank you for that question so <clears throat> vehicle miles are modeled through a number of different inputs um, included including transit oriented development like you just mentioned dense infill um, housing and so it all gets plugged into our model, and then that fits out miles traveled, like obviously black box that I'm, I'm saying. Um, but theoretically, in what I just presented to you in 2019, in 2030, our VMP should look different because of that transit brain that developed and what that model um, states. So that's, that's how we go about um, quantifying, and there's obviously full back end of calculations that go into that. But from a simplified perspective, that's how we would um, understand if what we're doing is, is working. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rosemary. Your presentation was so informative and really, um, you know, inspirational for what we can look forward to in the years moving forward. I guess my question is the same one that I brought up like on my first uh, council meeting is that we have those the, the natural gas power plant Moss Landing that supplies a lot of power to our region. And so for me, I'm still confused how converting it from natural gas to electricity is more carbon neutral than just using it as natural gas appliances that dryers, water heaters, et cetera. Like, how does that wait? Yeah, so you're you're asking the kind of crux of why our strategy hinges around building transportation, right? And that is because electricity that we, uh, we procure will be 100% renewable by 2030. Natural gas is not renewable. And one thing to think about is you can think about the grid as almost like a swimming and all of the, the power that, that's being provided is, you know, like the water is 
gets mixed together, electrons get mixed together. And then what we pull from, yes, the some that's close to us, but it also could be electrons that come from somewhere else, right? And there's really no way to necessarily trace that. Um, but I kind of digress. Um, so really the state understands, the state um, objective is also to try to get away from natural gas mission natural gas power plants and to get everything into electricity and then for us that's 100 percent renewable electricity now pg and e the default provider although they are not on as aggressive as um, a trajectory to um, bring on renewable energy they still have lots of renewable energy assets that make electricity cleaner than natural gas. The other things related to natural gas, aside from the emi high emission production potential of converting to electricity, is that natural gas has, been, has serious safety issues. There has been a lot of deferred maintenance on natural gas equipment and infrastructure where we see things like the San Bruno explosion happening. And we know that the investor-owned utilities like PG&E stood up, supported natural gas coefficients like ours because they recognized the need to get rid of our um, of the natural gas infrastructure. And then finally, I want to point to indoor air quality and indoor safety. So those are some of the reasons why converting to electricity is the way that the state and all of us are going and putting a climate action strategy. Thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to explain that because I kind of jumped into that with just the assumption that everyone knew that. So thank you. No, I appreciate that. I didn't know. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you so much, Tiffany, for the presentation and, and chatting with me last week as well. Uh, get a little bit more background and understand this uh, as best I can. <laughs> and um, so I, I just, I think this is great. I, I just want to highlight a couple of things. One, the you know, the incorporation of transportation and vehicle miles traveled into the uh, equation there to get us a more accurate um, sense of what, what it's going to take and where the real challenge is. I think that um, certainly that's an area that it, we are doing a lot of good work and we have a lot of challenges as well at the regional level around what our transportation infrastructure build out is going to look like. And so, um, you know, I just appreciate that, that bit. Um, I have, I have a couple of questions. So I'm, one is related to this. <laughs> um, so I, um, but I, before I do that, I just wanted to say, you know, I also really, really appreciate the focus on equity and, uh, you know, really trying to think about disproportionate impact of making some of these shifts, um, either with respect to the, um, residential commercial infrastructure, building electrification, but also transportation, as we know the cost the, of the ability for people to move around uh, in our community is constrained. And so, um, having that as a lens through which we make our decisions is is just like i'm so, i'm just thrilled that it's happening i'll leave it there um so with respect to the question around transportation i know that the city has done uh you know, very very well uh promoting active transportation developing infrastructure bike head infrastructure um i wish we were doing better on protected bike lanes and some of the other things i think will make bicycling more uh, attractive to people and obviously a lot of other things. But I wanted to ask specifically about our own vehicle fleet. This is something that, uh, and this may, this is really a question kind of more broadly. I'm, I'm not expecting this question. Um, but I have been, since I've been on the council, uh, really tried to advocate for and bring up uh, in at appropriate times uh, the need for transitioning our own and have had a lot of pushback. I'll, I'll just say I've had pushback from, you know, the staff and among my colleagues 
Uh, and so I'm just wondering if you can talk about um, the challenges, or, or if someone from staff, I don't know, I see uh, Mark, Saddle, you're here, um, maybe you. Um, why is it so hard <laughs> for us to, to really start moving in that direction and make a real dent in, in our uh, what are the challenges associated with that? What do you, and then maybe um, back to and Mark as well, if you have thoughts on what we can do to get more aggressive about that. I think that is fundamental, you know, like principle and set of actions that we can take, um, and the sooner the better. So, but I also understand, I mean, the pushback I've received, I, when I say that, I mean to say that's based on the realities or in the constraints you're operating in. So I'd just like to hear more about that. I think it's an area we can do better. I also get the... So, and I'm talking about now our, you know, all of our, and I know that um, public work kind of has, has some domain over those. So that's why I'm asking. Sure, if I can handle that one. Uh, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. Um, that's a great question and one of the things that um, we'd all love to have is an all electric fleet. Um, it does take um, some effort to get there. Um, first of all, let's talk about the steps that we've already done. Um, most of our pool cars are all reef, uh, reefs and electric, and we've done that probably, we're on the third generation of vehicles now. So we've been doing this for multiple years, um, and we encourage people to use the, the pool cars and reduce our fleet, actually. That's the, Best if we have less less vehicles. Um, second thing is is having the charging infrastructure in place. Um, we've gone ahead and we have charging at our hall for those vehicles. We also have charging in our courtyard, so we're ready to bring in vehicles, electric vehicles, when they are available. And that's the third thing. You can't go and buy an electric truck right now, which is the majority of our fleet. Um, you can't go to Ford and pick out a bike. So you can see the advertisement on on television. Um, you can put in a reservation if they're still taking those, and they're way out, they're months out, so they haven't produced them yet. Um, we're going to start seeing those in the next year. They should start hitting the streets, but to ramp up their production, you have all the cities and counties and commercial looking to purchase these vehicles. They're just currently not available. So what have we done? We've got our infrastructure, our charging infrastructure in place. So when they are available, we can bring them. Um, we're also, we've ordered one uh, refuse truck uh, and we have uh, grants that covered the additional 400,000, probably 600,000 total um, difference in cost of vehicles between a, a diesel or a, a natural gas truck or and an electric truck. And that's just, they are not making the volume that they need to. And, and battery technology is getting more efficient. It, the prices are coming down. And we're going to learn on this first generation um, electric refuse trucks, just like we learned on the hybrid refuse trucks that we ordered. Um, and they have problems. First generation always has problems just because they haven't worked out all the details yet. And we'll help them figure those out. But it's a, it's a transition process. So I wish I wish we could go to the store and purchase those um, electric vehicles. They're not there right now. They are less. Um, we're, we're very excited to get those vehicles. There's a lot less moving parts, a lot less things to repair. Um, if a motor goes out, you swap it out. It's not a major deal that we have with a diesel engine and that type of thing. So I think the technology is coming. Uh, the hype may be here before the actual you know, boots on the ground and we get get our hands on the vehicles. But I will tell you, as soon as we get that electric refuse truck, um, we will be driving that around and highlighting that and we hope that uh, April or May is my understanding. It should be here. So we're we're very excited for that. So I hope that answers your question. It's it's availability of vehicles and it's cost, those additional costs. We go after the grants, we're having the infrastructure in place so we can charge those vehicles when we do get them. Yeah, and just to add to what Mark's saying is that I think in the past two years, we have just made substantial progress in this area. There's also a front loader and other medium and heavy duty equipment that we're getting 
as Mark said, we are stacking incentives. You know, there's very real costs for charging when we have to replace major transformers. It's not as easy as just, you know, putting an electric vehicle charger in. Um, so, yeah, um, I think that we're making substantial progress in this regard. We just finished the study last summer to understand what else is possible. Um, so, you know, we need to test and innovate and grab part. Thank you. So, it sounds like um, then we are well positioned to take advantage of new um, technologies and opportunities as they become available. And I guess I'll just kind of harken back here to your point about the incorporation of social costs to our our cost analysis. And um, I mean, if, if we're serious about addressing our, our, our climate impact internally, I think that thinking about you know, maybe it is going to cost a little, it's going to cost more money. And I know it's not just a little more money now, but um, over time, that that goes into our prioritization, make those kinds of decisions. And, you know, I don't know if it sounds like we're, that's happening. And I also think that council thinking about how, how we, um, what are, you know, our priorities, what that means for. So, so I'll, I'll just put that one aside. I, so many things I'd love to say. Um, also, the police. Right, the police vehicles. I mean, I he, we hear that well, you can get them or they can customize, but then people send me information all the time saying yes, it can. So, you know, I agree that there's there is some hype um, that kind of gets out in front, um, but then at the same time, how are we how are we positioning ourselves? So glad to hear it and doing more. Uh, my other question is. Um, I guess it's really more of a comment, but sort of a question related to the, the, the equity component of this and how it is that people who are you know, low-income community members, people who are struggling, um, can access the kind of assistance one um, for new appliances, for you know, for to electrify their homes, um, but also I think um, Councilmember Golder's point about the cost. Well, the monthly cost for using electric utilities, and um, even when they're very efficient, uh, you know, your electric bill is a lot higher. So um, I'm just, and that rebates are going to be really important for infrastructure and kind of equipment side, but also the ongoing costs. I'm just wondering um, where is Central Coast Energy Services and part of this conversation and collaboration? Oh. I figured as much, yeah. but I just wanted to, um, because I know that they do a lot of really great work, weather, home weatherization and, you know, direct utility assistance, but other work as well. So. Yes. Yes, thank you for that question. So, um, like you, I've been hearing from these focus groups that, hey, we didn't know there was income tier incentives for electric vehicles. Hey, we didn't know about, so number one, engagement is going to be so critical on this. Number two, Central Coast Energy Services is already in the low-income homes doing weatherization. They can help us connect the dots. They're part of the federal infrastructure grant that we are doing with Watsonville for just that program. And then secondly, or the third, rather, we also need to look at folks who are on the care and the fair rates, which are the rates for low-income folks, and look at how can we uh, – is there something else that we can do to make sure that when they are electrofitted, that they are energy burdens not being increased? And that is a primary goal of our existing building electrification study that we have going on right now. So, yes, you touched on all the right areas um, that we need to be looking at. And again, I can't emphasize enough the engagement piece. One thing I didn't mention, but I know I've talked to each of you about, is at the end of this pro project we will be launching a community activation platform that will help link people into this, like, hey, come on, be part of this process. To draw on best practices, teaming in, gamification, to bring people in to understand how that collectively we can reach these goals, but also to connect them to those rebate incentives that are out there. And we have nonprofit partners in College Action who hopefully are going to help us on that engagement piece to connect so 
thank you for, for raising that issue. Um, thank you. And I'll, I'm, I'm finished for now. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Uh, Council member coming. Thank you. Um, thanks for that presentation, Tiffany. And it's been, you know, great to be able to follow this process for a long time being on the climate action task force and appreciate all your hard work and all the hard work of all the members of the community who contributed to this. Um, one question that I think comes up pretty often is how are carbon emissions measured in terms of, you know, like what cities are producing and like how are they measured over time? I think um, you know, a lot of people have been curious about, I know vehicle miles traveled is one, but um, are there other ways that um, carbon emissions are measured? Yes, and um, I would refer folks back to our 2020 Climate Action Plan closeout report, which um, gives the specific metrics that we track uh, to measure emissions. Energy usage is another of those, and we, we are, that data are readily available. Um, vehicle miles traveled is the other for transportation. For waste, it is the um, the volume of waste exposed, and for wastewater treatment, it's process emissions, which there are specific calculations for. Now, we know that those are state scoping plan areas, but there are other areas where there is embodied carbon, for example, as I mentioned before, in, um, you know, online purchasing and delivery, diet, um, carbon sequestration. Right now, except for carbon sequestration, there are not good measurement techniques. Um, they would require consumption-based inventories that are complex and costly. Um, and we do not, and nor do many um, jurisdictions in California, that kind of quantification. Great. Um, next question, I'll try to make this quick because I know we have some other items we need to get to. I imagine there's a couple who want to ask questions. Um, so you mentioned that Watsonville met their like kind of forty percent reduction in their carbon emissions. Well, we had nine. I'm wondering if there's any um, lessons that we can learn from Watsonville, any takeaways that can help us um, improve our meeting our carbon emission goals. Yeah, that isn't a matter necessarily of you know one or the other doing better. Watsonville does not include the um, emissions associated the vehicle miles traveled um, that end or start within and or outside of the city. Um, and we do. And as I said, you know, we originally thought we met. Um, our 2030, our 2020 goal of a 30 percent reduction. So we thought we had had a 30 percent reduction until we added in additional vehicle miles traveled, which bumped up our emissions by a uh, 23 additional percentage. And so, you know, they have Watsonville has a different situation than we do. It's, um, you know, they have uh, more land for sequestration, which they um, are going to rely on to meet their carbon neutrality aspirational target. Um, I do think that Watsonville has done a really great job of engaging their community, especially, obviously, their Spanish-speaking community that we can take lessons from. They are innovating outside of the box on things like biochar and um, other kind of, you know, technologies that um, we're not necessarily talking about here right now. So um, I'm not sure it's an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, but as I said, we are certainly learning from one another. Um, we talk every week and we are coordinating on a lot of people, um, priorities that we have really are what I shared today. Thanks. I think it would be good to, um, as you all are having those kind of conversations around regional approach, it'd be good to like get a sense or see if there's any opportunity for us to be able to set for the jurisdictions to be able to set um with their metrics so that for example if we're comparing ourselves to Watsonville and you know Watsonville's at 40 percent Santa Cruz is, is meeting nine there's different metrics it's gonna be really hard for people in the community to understand you know, why we're not meeting the goals that other communities are meeting so maybe even just showing those as like two different options like under you know this scenario with vehicle miles travel taken out 
piloted full measure of carbon emissions in the region, you know, we have a 30% reduction, but putting this, you know, adding this factor brings us down. And I know that you've explained that to us today, but I'm just trying to think if there's ways that we can try to streamline this across the region, it will really I think be helpful for um, people throughout the region to understand how well we're doing. No, absolutely. You raise a great point, and there has been a lot of discussion around uh, preparing regional climate action plans. You know that AMBAG's very interested in something like that. Um, so there's a lot of discussion because it is confusing. It's you know even when I showed you all the different targets that folks have, they're all different. It's two different things. Some are CEQA qualified, some aren't. It can be really confusing, and I really discourage people from comparing apples to apples across the jurisdiction because of those nuances. So thank you for that comment, and hopefully more to come on the regional collaboration around potential targets, metrics, tracks, and climate action. Thanks. And then my last question. Um, so you've given us a number of options today. I guess the first part of the, I guess I'll ask my first question. Do we need to adopt um, one of these target goals today? We don't. Okay. Um, then I guess my second question is, you know, you provided us with a number of different options today um, as examples of how we can kind of set our goals. I guess the first part of the question is, is there any consequence to not meeting those targets? And, um, and I ask that because, I, you know, climate change is probably one of the biggest, you know, threats to public health and to communities you know, across the globe and think that in our community many people want to see us set really high ambitious targets and so you know if, i feel like if there's not negative consequence to setting up an ambitious goal why don't we just go for that knowing that that's our you know, that's our goal we're setting the bar high we might not make it but we're going to do our best and so just wondering if you could maybe uh, speak to that a little because it sounded like trying to have a really ambitious goal could have negative impact on like how we try to meet goals. So speak to that a little. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. So there is a consequence to not meeting people qualified cap targets, and that is that we can be sued. So that is important to remember that we are trying to go for a people qualified cap. We are going for a people qualified cap because it is the strongest driver for us to reduce emissions and new development and it gives us that streamlined CEQA approach. However, you can adopt both the CEQA qualified cap target and a voluntary aspirational target where if you do not meet the voluntary aspirational target that is outside of the CEQA qualified cap, there is not a legal consequence to that. Right. So that's, yeah, those are my questions and I guess comment. But I think, you know, as we move forward, um, I know the community that many community members have expressed just wanted to take an aggressive approach. So my hope is that we can adopt a target that seems reasonable and feasible, but then also, as you mentioned, have an aspirational kind of voluntary target that we're willing to try to meet as well. So we can kind of have a win-win situation for everyone in our community. Thanks. Thank you for that feedback. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, let's see, Council Member Kalantari Johnson and then Council Member Watson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you so much, Tiffany, for the presentation and all the work. Um, I have a couple of questions and some comments. Uh, I had a similar question as to Council Member Cummings, but sort of the flip side is, um, are we more competitive for funding opportunities if we do uh, commit to the aspirational, more aggressive targets? Potentially. Um, if we're aligned with the state carbon neutrality target that bodes well for us on the state level, there is some private sector funding that um, wants to see a 2030 aspirational target um, adopted that we may or may not be competitive for. Um, so potentially. Okay. Great. So it's something for us to consider. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of thinking about regional metrics, where, and, and, and I don't know if you know the answer to this or, or how we can think about it, but how do the four cities fit within the county targets that the county is pulling through that process? Yeah, 
I know you said that we're we're communicating with each of the jurisdictions and we're talking to the county, but but is there um, and you said there isn't apples to apples, but how do the four cities fit within the county target? That is TBD. The, okay. the county has started their process and they have been incredibly inclusive and thoughtful in their process so far. Um, had a number of degrees already um, as, as a city, but I don't know how that's going to play out so far in their existing climate action strategy. Um, we did not, um, there was not any kind of crosswalk like that, um, but they are including, they do see also that they don't need to reinvent the wheel on a lot of the work that we've done, whether it comes to the equity based work, community engagement, the building electrification. So, you know, Again, it's early to say because they're just part of the process. They're scoping right now. It's very early for them. Okay, great. Uh, and then just a couple comments. Uh, I know you mentioned that you were working very closely with each of the departments, but as we heard a couple weeks ago around the um, state housing bills and that we will be engaging um, on revising our housing element in our general plan, um, it's a really great opportunity to look at the intersection of our climate action efforts, transportation and housing and how we wanna move forward with housing. Um, so that's a great opportunity there. And then I was also really uh, pleased to hear and see about the equity screening tool and the community engagement efforts that, that you have put into place. And I know that you've already reached out and done focus groups with youth, but we've now formalized our relationship with the Youth Action Network and their youth steering committee. So hopefully we can continue to engage um, um, at least that youth group, if not others, as we continue this work. Absolutely. I welcome, I talk with anybody that wants to talk to me about this stuff, but particularly youth and historically underrepresented folks we're seeking to, to talk to. Great. Thank you so much for all the work. Thank you. Thank you, Colin Perry Johnson and uh, Council Member Watkins. I um, well, I'll just echo my colleagues' comments and appreciation of the plan and the work that has gotten us this far. I think the majority, actually, of my questions have been asked and answered in regards to the fleet and the challenges associated with that. I guess I was curious about the penalty or sort of the accountability of state legislation, and I know you got into it a little bit with. Uh, the potential of being sued. I just, I'm thinking about how far along the city of Santa Cruz is in terms of our prioritizing um, climate action and mitigations and um, adaptability and in comparison to other jurisdictions with more urban sprawl or less of an in doing so, where do, like, where does that fall in terms of state legislation in terms of accountability with, you know, how we move forward uh, in terms of operationalizing the legislation and the plans. Yes, thank you for that question, Council Member Watkins. The accountability on the resilience work is not tied to the emissions work that we're doing right now. Um, that is through separate legislation. In terms of the accountability on the climate action plan itself, it comes down to the thresholds that we're developing for development comes through. And um, if we cannot demonstrate the progress that we said we needed to make, which I outlined for you today as the SB 32 minimum, if we cannot show that we made that progress, that sets us up for legal risk. And so, and could invalidate some of the development that came through on a streamlined environmental. And so that, that's, I have to say though, I am not a CEQA expert. Um, but that is uh, from a high level and the risk to be in terms of accountability. Now, with that said, part of our implementation plan will include accountability mechanisms to ensure that we are making sufficient progress towards whatever our school qualified target will be. And so that will be an important part is that whole accountability mechanism allowing us to just of course we are not on track. Um, because we do need to, you know, we will need to make um, those emissions reductions to adopt policy. And in terms of like how that relates to other 
locations like with urban sprawl and such like that how do you i mean just generally how do you anticipate them as you know adapting to this new legislation and goal well if if they choose to pursue a sequel qualified cap they will have to develop their own threshold that they will be held to um you know that their climate action plan demonstrates hey the city itself is going to make these reductions and you know these developments then get this streamlined review process but also have lower emissions themselves other cities that have a sequel qualified cap will have will be under the same type of scenario that they have to have some accountability otherwise they'll be in legal trouble okay um no i appreciate that and then in terms of the you know the i know you mentioned it in your presentation about a five-year update and i think that makes a lot of sense especially because i feel like you know, from the meta level, the Cal, you know, the state of California is really setting this um, aspirational target kind of goal with technology, hopefully, kind of, you know, hopefully keeping up and then innovating to the next level. So having those checkpoints and earlier kind of update potential to really adapt to that is, um, I think, really beneficial for our community and our plan in general. Okay, thank you, Tiffany. Absolutely, thank you so much, council members. Thank you. Um, I, and I'll just chime in uh, quickly. Thank you for all the questions. All of my questions regarding the equity uh, screening tool answered. Um, and I just have to emphasize, I appreciate the focus on, um, you know, looking at affordability and accessibility. And um, uh, I have two questions. What is biochar? And what are next steps now in March? Well, biochar is not something I know a lot about, but it's basically converting biocells water facility into a fuel. But from what we understand, that's a very, very early kind of nascent technology. You, you had mentioned that in uh, context of Watsonville, so I was curious. Okay. Yeah, there and um, between now and March, in the next study session, what do you see as kind of those next steps? Um, we will be having more focus groups. We'll have the online engagement platform on the actions, um, and we will be developing our implementate our draft implementation funding. Those are the three key things that we'll be doing in preparation for that. That. Uh, Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, this is the part where I seek out public comment and uh, and then we'll return to council for any further back. So let me go to attendee list. Um, if you're interested in commenting on this Climate Action Plan 2030 target setting study session, Press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you can unmute it and the timer will be set to two minutes. So it looks like our first telephone number ends in 4839. Hello. Press star six to unmute. Hello. I think I've just been unmuted. You have. Um, thank Hello. you so much for having this uh, council session. And because climate change is on my mind every day, every moment. My name is Megan Clemens. I've been working, um, I've been volunteering for the last few, last month, I think, with the Climate Action Task Force. Um, and I'm just, I just appreciate you all for being able to look climate change in the face. It's not an easy thing to do. And you guys are our heroes for my children and our grandchildren that are gonna be raised um, in this town, hopefully. And um, we just really want to minimize the risk of climate change and you guys have the power to do it. So I really appreciate you, Tiffany, so much for bringing everything you know to this point. And I hope that all you council members will um, support Tiffany because I think she's super smart and she's including so many people to help create this plan 
and um, I I just want to say I vote for the aspiration to include the aspirational goal because I think it builds hope in our community and it shows that we really want to do as much as we can. And um, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you so much, Megan. The next caller is Pauline Steele. Pauline, press star six. I'm on Zoom. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Thanks, Sydney. This was great. I've been on the Climate Action Task Force for a few years and represent Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. There was a lot of good stuff in this. One of the things we have to keep in mind is that the ultimate inequity, disequity, is not dealing adequately with climate change. Because the poor people will be hurt the most. Uh, people who live in beach flats, for example, people who work outside, working fields, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm very happy that equity parts are being considered. I want to really urge Council to strongly consider these aspiration goals. I'm old enough that I was around when Kennedy said, We're gonna put a man on the moon. Now, that was an aspirational goal. NASA had no clue about the details, but they knew they had a lot of good people. And in that case, what was lacking was the money. Technology was not there. We have the opposite city. The technologies we need are here. It's just difficult to apply them without money. But the state budget is looking good. There will be more money in the future. Please go for the aspirational goal. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline Steele. Our next caller, I am watching you. Uh, you are and plan on spending a lot of public money and plan to overregulate people's lives and choices under the guise of one of the greatest scams in history, namely the CO2 climate change panic save the planet fast hysteria scam. I missed any slide where Tiffany indicated a certain change for the Earth's climate as a result of proposed action in Santa Cruz at what cost and are only discussing this in terms of government mandates in place that have no predictive value as to climate. It's based on fear, not unlike the COVID response, which is the other fear-based current mass abuse of freedom. Based on assumptions with no real scientific certainty, the recent volcano near Tonga probably had more climate effect than anything Santa Cruz could ever do. The EU, which is a globalist control and, and generally has embraced the climate change hysteria, has now declared gas and nuclear power green because they realize there is currently no reliable energy alternatives to generate the power we need to turn an inhospitable planet into a hospitable planet. My gas bill is cheap. Our natural gas is the cleanest fossil fuel to thank we water molecules in one CO2 as byproducts when burned. Plants love CO2 and the earth is very resilient. I won't get into the unresolved science of this, but it is quite unresolved. Clear we cannot predict or control even short-term future weather to any extent, let alone climate. Need to embrace the idea we're in a 200-year warming trend and a longer 20,000-year warming trend with no clue as to what really comes next, perhaps even another ice age. No one knows. Opinion largely follows the money. Mandates cannot lead viable solutions. I applaud the density per minute of climate buzzwords that Tiffany can spew out. She's aggressively advocating the maximum of changes on people's lives with no proof of value. Climate change is all about money, all about power, and to quote George Carlin, I have certain rules to live by, and the first, I don't believe anything the government says. I'm not giving up my gas water heater until it's cheaper or my gas fireplace. Thank you, I am watching you. Next caller is Peter Beach here. Hello, City Council. This is uh, Peter Beach here. I have a very well. So, um, this. Can you hear me now? Good, thanks. Um, and uh, I just want to let you know that I've done some, uh, again, this is Peter Beach here, Community Liaison for the City of Santa Cruz. I've done several. Um, several surveys for Tiffany 
and uh, especially in lower ocean and beach flat, the underrepresented areas. And just uh, over there throughout, the community is always asking the question. First of all, they say they're always they're worried about getting electrified, mostly because as it is in their neighborhoods, the electricity goes off many times. And when it comes back, it ruins their appliances. So they're worried the more and more we get off the grid that this is going to happen in the future. And then the other major question they always have, yeah, I don't expect you to answer it, but just throughout your communications in the future, is also with, with the lower income people and underrepresented, is also uh, where is all this energy going to come from? It's kind of like the overall bigger question of the, where the power and the grid uh, or the capability of the grid to uh, change all our economy and our appliances and our vehicles uh, to an electrical system that's maybe beyond the city, but still something to think about uh, as a big picture. Thank you so much, Peter, for that input. Next caller, Alan Pierce. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, first, a uh, great huge thanks to Tiffany and her whole team for the work that went into this presentation and the ongoing work with the task force, which I'm hoping to finally get to join. Uh, there, there was a lot to unpack. It is a huge challenge. That was notwithstanding the uh, two speakers ago viewpoints. I think the scientists, 99.7% of them agree that we have a serious problem that's human caused. What I was going to address is your point about engagement and getting more people kind of riled up and excited to participate, uh, both in low income, moderate income, and affluent, just across the board, getting people really engaged. And one way to do that is this cool city.earth organization that I've been working with. I'm trying to get the city to be interested in working with them. It's about working with people block by block. And there's a pretty big amount of work involved in getting the application. Together, but we can take a look at Petaluma, which pulled it off, or Irvine. Believe it or not, the city of LA. So they've all won the award for this past year. And I would love to see Santa Cruz win the award for this year. And I would love to work closely with Tiffany to make that happen. It's a moonshot, similar to the Apollo program in a way, trying to engage people at each level of excitement and enthusiasm. And it comes down to building relationships and really well organized. Employment. So I hope hopefully you'll hear more from me over the coming weeks. That's all. Thank you, Ellen. Next caller, Lanny Faulkner. Hi, thank you, Santa Cruz City Council. And um, I only came on uh, very shortly uh, recently when I was asked to come on, and I'm glad that I did. Tiffany, I will definitely be reaching out to you. Um, I'm the director of Equity Transit, a local organization here, bringing the awareness around uh, transit inequity and envir uh, environmental justice to our community. Um, I definitely want to look and listen to Tiffany's presentation. I understand these are recorded, so that's wonderful. Um, I appreciate Justin's comment and agree with Colleen. We love to see um, the reach for those aspirational goals. I think that's really essential given the critical nature of our environment. Um, I just want to make a note that uh, listening to recent global summits in Glasgow and a number of top environmental leaders, global environmental scientists realm, that we really need to be thinking about getting away from any sort of highway widening because the long-term investment of that takes away from our focus, which is public transportation. We know that robust public transportation systems serve both equity and the environment. And that really is where um, our razor focus should be um, leading. And uh, let's see, oh, there's something else I wanted to do. Yes, around e-vehicles. E I have a really great presentation I'd love to offer to the Climate Action Task Force um, that talks really about how even though e-vehicles are a great step for us, they really aren't the solution, they're part of the solution, but they have their own degree of you know, mining that goes into them and toxic 
rubber tires and all sorts of things that we would have to think about the batteries and chemicals that go into those. So we really think of long-term solutions, which means that we're talking about building systems that last long term, reduce our overall impact. Thank you so much. Can I say one more thing? And that is um, February 4th is National Day and would really want to spread the information to invite the city and everyone to join us for that. And we'll have more information at uh, equitytransit.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bonnie Foster. Uh, the next caller is phone number, like ending in 4227. You're on your phone, press star six and you're eight. I believe I've unmuted. Yes? Yes. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, hi. Thank you. This is Beverly Day Show. I'm with the Electric Auto Association, as well as I've been on Tiffany's task force and Tiffany and the team have really done a great deal of work. Uh, it's very impressive, the, the presentation. I had a couple of things that I wanted to clarify that I think got tossed around but didn't really completely get clarified. And that's having to do with switching from electric, switching, excuse me, from fossil fuels to electric, which of course could be fueled by fossil fuel, but we're looking for uh, renewable energy. Um, so the, the argument is for, the argument hasn't actually been clarified. The argument is for electrification because number one, it's renewable, which I think Tiffany did mention. We can have it renewable, whereas the natural gas is not renewable. But secondly, they're way more efficient. So in my almost 15 years of uh, doing educational events for electric vehicles, um, what we have learned and told people is that when you switch to an electric vehicle, you immediately reduce your emissions by approximately 75% because of the efficiency of the vehicle compared to burning gas. Um, and that's true also of heat pumps, which the, that word was not mentioned. So what you switch from when you switch from your, um, your, your uh, heating unit for, for air heating, and also for water heating is a heat pump. And what I've read is that they can be up to three times more efficient than their counterpart in natural gas. Um, I've also read that they're not quite that much. So I'm not really sure entirely what that involves. You know, what, really what the, what the um, is, is that is that cutting me off, that noise? Yes. Is that telling me to I shut up? <laughs> okay, uh, just one more quick thing, and that is that they're, um, that we have looked for the future of having a lot of used electric vehicles that will allow for there to be equity because they can Beverly, be bought for extremely I have, cheap. I have to cut you off. Um, okay, bye. Thank you. <laughs> um, anybody is, is welcome to email us and or especially if you're on the task force. Further input that is not able to be said. In this part of the moment, but wanting to be mindful of other callers. The next caller is Kirsten Lisk. Good evening, hey, council members, and Tiffany, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, a lot of wonderful information. I just want to, I'm with Kirsten Lisk, the Vice President of Community Programs at Ecology Action. And I just want to acknowledge the great work that Tiffany has done and done a great job of including our task force feedback. And she is leading our region in, in figuring out real ways to center equity throughout procedurally and involving people. And it's been an honor and a, a privilege and a lesson to be part of that process. And just a couple things that I want to um, just share from my perspective is I really like the direction that it seems like this is heading where adopting real practical practicable goals and then aspirational goals what that'll do is if we move the needle on those practicable goals and get those advanced but have the aspirational goal as new technologies and opportunities and funding sources emerge we will have already done what we can and be ready for those next step opportunities so we're strongly in favor in part of just being really real about that if we don't move toward these aspirational targets, 
we're going to have more fires, we're going to have more flooding, we're going to have more emergencies, we're going to have more health crises, and it's going to become unman more unmanageable than it already feels like it is. So while climate change feels expensive, it's a root cause of a lot of these things that are causing our community a lot of distress, and it offers the promise of coming up with some real dramatic and fa fabulous solutions like increased community connectivity and a lot of the transportation and housing solutions that Tiffany mentioned could really strengthen and create a really exciting new future for human beings on the planet and here in Santa Cruz. So that's great. The couple things I wanted to mention as well is while we're waiting to get the plan adopted, figure out the funding and adopt budgets, there's emerging needs right now, one of which is the regional project development that Tiffany has mentioned. We're partnering actively as she we need funding to support project development or externally. Um, so I'd really recommend you consider that and I'll I'll drop a quick email to the council to let them know where that's at in the next week or so as we firm up what, where that's headed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And the, uh, are there any other callers that would like to call in for a public comment? on climate action plan 2030 strategy target setting study session okay then we will return to the council for further feedback and comments any council members have council member brown Thank you, Mayor. I'll just say very quickly, uh, thank you again. And um, since I, I didn't say it before in my comments slash questions, I, I absolutely agree. I really appreciate the way that organized and laid out the possibilities. And I think we must, just it absolutely must be incumbent on us to adopt those aspirational goals and to do everything we possibly can to meet them. Um, it's, there's just no, I, there's no question in my mind. And I, I imagine that, um, that's the case for um, my colleagues. Most of the folks here have been, attended this meeting. So I, I, um, I just really appreciate all of the work that you've done, the knowledge that you have to, and your ability to connect across the region with different partners to really, really, um, focus in and, and, um, Really, really intentional about engaging with uh, community members whose voices aren't aren't often heard, uh, and um, just keep going, carry on, and um, looking forward to uh, revisiting this in March. Work to uh, as we get into implementation in various uh, arenas. So let's let's do it. Council Member Brown, are there any other council members that would like to comment? All right. Well, if that is the case, then uh, we will return at seven for our special meeting advisory body interviews, and this meeting will now be adjourned. Thank you so much. I think we're just about ready to begin. Looks like we are missing one council member, but we will go ahead and begin. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our seven o'clock, January 18th, 2022 special meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move into our regular meeting. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on tonight's agenda item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. 
please note there can be a delay in stream streaming. So if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. And it is time for public comment. Press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that it's your turn to speak. And you will need to press star six to unmute yourself if you are on your phone. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have made your comment. And I would like to ask the city clerk to please call roll. Mayor, member Helen Corey Johnson. Present. Here. Here. No. Here. Present. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, I would also like to announce that this is a special meeting. Our topic this evening is to hear from applicants who have applied to various city council advisory bodies. No oral communications or discussions on other items will be heard at this meeting. I'll now open it up for public comment for anyone other than applicants. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment on the advisory body interviews? If you are interested in commenting, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you can unmute yourself by pressing star six. The timer will then be set. Let me look at our attendees and see if anybody has their hand raised. Don't see anyone with their hand raised at this time. Okay. Well, then now on to our interviews. The way I'd like to approach the flow of this meeting is to call on applicants by commission and then alphabetically by last name. Due to the number of attendees, each applicant will have an opportunity to speak one time each and will be called upon to speak on their first choice advisory body. And if anybody applied for more than one advisory body, you may use this time to speak to those as well. When I announce it's your turn to speak, you will be invited to turn on your cameras, to unmute yourself, and to speak to council. If you do not hear the announcement that you have been unmuted, please press star nine to raise your hand. And I'll allow three minutes per person to speak about your experience for each of the advisory bodies you have applied to. This time is a time for you to personally introduce yourselves to amplify your qualifications and relevant backgrounds. Additionally, the meeting is mostly informal to allow the council to get to know you. Council members have received and reviewed all the applications. And now I will ask the clerk for any additional updates and or information. Um, yes, sorry, I thought we did have a person through. Okay. So, Rebecca Rockham, R O C but across her application your binders. Great, thank you. Does that conclude the additional any additional information? Hello. 
Okay, so let's jump right in. Thank you all for being here this evening. I will uh, begin with the Arts Commission. Please prepare yourself to be ready to speak. I have the, the order of uh, applicants that have applied alphabetically is Elizabeth Birnbaum, Robert Blitzer, Mary Pop, Everett Okila, Vivian Vargas, and Grant Whipple. First up, uh, Elizabeth Birnbaum is seeking reappointment to the Arts Commission. Elizabeth, you will be promoted to the panelist if you are in attendance, and then you will be able to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. I do see you here. Yeah. I Welcome. Am. Yeah, I'm not sure how to turn on my camera, but I would love to. Is there another? <laughs> But Do you fine. see an, an icon? Are you on a device or a, a computer? I'm on a computer, and it's um, there's a microphone setting and a your setting. That's okay. If you can hear me, okay. I don't mind. Um, I just I'll be super quick, so I know I'm the first one. We can get moving. Um, Thank you. Yeah, of course. So hi everybody. I'm Liz Birnbaum. Um, been on the Arts Commission for four years, and most recently serving as the vice chair. Um, been thinking back a lot to my very first meeting four years ago when we sat in um in actually kind of like an additional session and talked about equity and inclusivity and environmental justice and I'm really passionate about making sure that those topics stay on our radar and I'm really proud of the work we have done over the last four years um with still yet a lot to come and also our last meeting was about the you know the card program the you know um, the arts recovery program and just listening to all the amazing work that's being done and has potential to be done um made me feel even more excited just attend and say i would love to be a part of making all of that happen in the coming year and years on the arts commission because I was like emotional and like screenshotting all these things and like making notes and texting folks about how amazing it all was um, going to come together. So um, I would just love to continue to participate. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, next is Robert Blitzer. And I will look not sure if Robert Butcher is in attendance. Uh, if you are, are you, is your number ending in 2316? Press star nine to raise your hand if it is. You are Robert Butcher. If not, I will move on to the next name alphabetically in the Arts Commission. And that would be Mary Pop. I don't see Mary Pop in attendance. If uh, your name is not showing, you have a phone number, and I do call your name, you can raise uh, your hand by star nine. So I'll move on to Everett O. O'Kalen. Welcome. I saw you. I don't. It just takes a couple. Wonderful. Thank you. I guess it's working. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I realize this room has a lot of echo. Um, I'm Edward Um, My pronouns are them. 
and um, I am here tonight to um, introduce myself and talk a little bit about my interest in joining Arts Council. Um, I recognize a lot of faces here. It's really brilliant to see everyone. Um, this is my first time um, applying for this position, and um, I am current. I currently am the acting uh, manager of exhibitions and special projects at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. Um, I'm actually currently in the gallery right now. We're in the throes of installing an exhibition for the Rydell Fellowship uh, for 2020 and 2021. Um, all very exciting. Um, my background uh, in terms of um, working within public arts, um, I received my master's in museum studies with a focus in contemporary art and working with uh, public art and also in community collaborations. Um, my favorite thing about what I get the opportunity to do here at the MA is work with a range of different artists and communities. And so it's just really been such a joy and a pleasure to do that. And I would like to continue from doing that uh, through working with the Arts Council. Um, I. I was uh, a middle school teacher for 50, over 15 years here in the county, and I also was the assistant principal at two elementary schools here in the county, and I uh, coordinated the after school program and parent outreach programs. When I retired, I volunteered to help out the census 2020, and I chose uh, an art contest as one way of reaching 
the community. Uh, this was the children and youth in the beach flats community and the lower ocean communities. These were areas that in the previous census were undercounted. To help me with this contact, uh, this contest, I contacted Latinx uh, businesses, owners, employees, and this is taquerias, mercados, the produce stands, uh, all of these people to help me distribute the art and materials for this contest, information about the contest, and also uh, flyers on the importance of the census. I was also from 2011 to 2015, uh, the Latino Affairs Commissioner for the city of Santa Cruz. And last year I founded Riders of Color Santa Cruz County, and we are working to bring our stories forward. I am interested, I wanna be on this arts commission because I believe in the power of art to make our lives better. I feel that what I bring to the table is the ability to listen, to, uh, to learn, and to also um, years of also I, I have years of experience and so uh, I want to thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to present myself and uh, thank you for considering my application for the Arts Commission. Thank you, Vivian, for that introduction. Watkins, I think we lost Mayor Bruner. Yeah. You're, or she's coming back. I see that. Yeah. Never mind. I had to check it wasn't me. <laughs> okay. I would like to invite our last arts commissioner applicant, Grant Whipple. Grant, you will be promoted to panelist if you are in attendance. And you will then be able to unmute yourself. The if you are on a telephone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And I do not see Grant Smithson. So um, that will conclude the Arts Commission applicants. We will now hear from applicants who chose the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women as their first choice of advisory body. As I call your name, please prepare yourself and be ready to speak. We have Deborah Christie, Rachel Pippin, Emma Ladina, and Samantha Rose Lee that have applied. And if I start in alphabetical order, Deborah Christie will be first. And um, I don't see Deborah Christie, so I will move on to Rachel Pippen. And Rachel Pippen, if you are here, we'll just take a moment. I believe you will be promoted. Here we go to panelists. Wonderful. The technology is working. Hi. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to introduce myself and share a little bit more about my application. Uh, my name is Rachel Kippen. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, and I know you've seen my application, but just to kind of reiterate some of the experience I have that um, makes this mission feel like a good fit. I've lived in this town for a decade, working primarily in sustainability, climate, waste issues, environmental education, and ocean conservation. Um, there's a lot of ties issues in all of those fields. I have formal academic experience in understanding women's issues um, and women's rights through graduate studies in social ecology and environmental justice education. Unfortunately, like most women, I have personal lived experience. I don't think that needs to be a requirement, but as experience does count um, in casual daily sexism, systemic misogyny, and gender violence, my places of work and study. <clears throat> and I've written about these issues in my twice monthly column, Santa Cruz. I'm currently on the Commission on the Environment for the County of Santa Cruz, where I've helped an ad hoc board of diversity, equity, justice, 
environmental justice, understanding the nuances of bias. And I didn't mention this in my application, but I was a grant award winner in 2018 as an scholar for my work in sustainability and its intersections with feminism and my native Hawaiian heritage. Um, and that was under the subtopic of environmental justice. It's only genuine if it includes. I think I'd be a good fit for this position. Um, I understand that there's a wealth of experience with people who have careers in domestic violence prevention and women's shelter and housing, job force development, healthcare, reproductive rights. Um, but I also understand the ramifications of movements for the betterment of women must extend far beyond their traditional um, understanding in our society. Sexism and then violence against women is commonplace in science, in field work, in research, and in ocean careers, and that happens. I would hope to help create strengths and bridges into those sectors and enhance any work that is already done on the commission in that area specifically. I've led training and initiatives um, related to equity, women's rights, um, and most recently received a grant um, for a former organization to create an LGBT training program um, amongst multiple environmental education organizations make safe work LGBT specifically, yet there are a lot of shared of violence against women um, and gender violence. I guess ultimately, I, also, I just keep coming back to the fact that we're really supporting women in STEM and science and education and sustainability fields, um, and then ultimately leading them to places that are um, unsafe school that they attend or workplaces that they're in. Um, and there's so much opportunity to shift that culture. Um, and I feel like that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for introducing yourself, Rachel. Thank you for your application. Next, I have Emma Ledwina. Emma, your hand is raised. There you go. You are on a phone. You can press star six to mute yourself or here as a panelist. Wonderful. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having me. Um, also, that last person was great. Well done, Rachel. Um, as you can see from my application, I have both professional and lived experience that qualify me for this position. I have a master's degree in social work from Columbia University. While I was in school there, I worked in a revolutionary safe house for women and children in Manhattan. And I also worked as a therapist and advocate for women and children in a safe house when I lived in Colorado. I also have a decade of experience working with child welfare services in three different states, including recently, most recently, um, I spent six years at Santa Cruz County Child Welfare Services. Um, obviously in child welfare, many of my clients were women and children who had experienced violence in their homes. In that role, I often was able to work with local law enforcement, victim advocates, um, and both Monarch Services and Walnut Ave Women's Center, and I built solid working relationships around the city and the county. Um, I now currently work as a therapist at the Parent Center, where I work with parents who are currently involved with the child welfare system. So again, many of my clients have experienced violence in their homes and have navigated all of the systems and programs associated. So I have both an intimate and professional understanding of the needs of women and children experiencing violence. I've experienced engaging them in their own advocacy and healing. And I know what we do well in the city and where the opportunities for growth. I have a deep commitment for creating safe spaces for women and children and ensuring the supports that they need to create those spaces for themselves. That's all I'm gonna say for now. Thank you so much for considering me for this role. Thank you very much for your application. Thank you. We have one more applicant, Samantha Rose Lee. Let's see if Samantha is here. Samantha, if you are here and you are on a telephone device, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. I will move on. 
Uh, let's move on then to the next category. Thank you for the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. And now the next category will be the Downtown Commission. We will now hear from applicants who chose the Downtown Commission as their first choice of advisory body. As I call your name, please prepare yourself to be ready to speak. Carolyn S. Bookelli, Jenna Lee Dolan, Savannah Hartwell, Bub Radar, and Rafa Sonnenfeld. First up is Carolyn Bookelli. Carolyn, you will be promoted to panelist, and then you will be able to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. I see Carolyn here in. Welcome, Carolyn. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Carolyn Kelly. Uh, thank you for having me here today. This is my first commission position I am applying for. I have a lot to learn and appreciate the opportunity to learn from other commissioners and from the community. Uh, I'm a mother of, I've had the opportunity to travel and live in many places. As a resident owner, visitor to the downtown area, I hope to have a meaningful impact as well as by the bylaws of the Downtown Commission, I do own property downtown. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for introducing yourself. Next, I have Jenna Lee Dolan. Hey, Jenna Lee, you are here. There you go. Okay, welcome, Jenna Lee. Hello. Oh, I can see. Oh, there you go. Okay, hi. Hi, welcome. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I am honored to be here tonight with you guys. Um, so I would love to be on this downtown commission as a member um, for a variety of reasons in what is downtown and my love and passion for it. But Let's kind of start with the background of history. I have been a founding board member of the Children's Museum of Discovery, as well as the chair of the Children's Advisory Council for that. I co-founded, helped launch Camp Heart and Hands, a camp for children with cancer, um, going through their journey and their families. Um, but more notable for the downtown and my impact there, um, I am, well, I'm a, I'm a single mom of three little amazing girls, and I own two businesses downtown, Yoso Wellness Spa and Yoso the Annex. And I have been in business nine and a half years, but happily located three and a half in the downtown um, area, as well as Yoso the Annex. I opened during COVID and the pandemic um, as other businesses were unfortunately closing. I was so honored to be able to open a second business um, in the heart of our community and still continue to thrive as a personal service business and a retail location in downtown. Um, which has been such an honor to be in that space. Um, I have also been a member of the Alliance of Women Entrepreneurs downtown. I have you know, a variety of different impacts that I make in volunteering and supporting our downtown. Um, well, I'll go again and say like the heart of what is Santa Cruz. Um, I am also for the last three years been a member of the Downtown Association and um, I'm Currently, for the last year, the chair of the marketing committee for the downtown station. And I have worked, spent some time doing some work and sponsoring, supporting the downtown streets team and doing events with them. I participate in a variety of different beautification projects and um, sponsorships and activities within our community and really believe in the longevity and the vibrancy that the downtown currently has and has to come in our future and would love to be a part in helping that process along. Um, I've also within our downtown area started with a part of what we call bridging the gap. And that was to do a, re a river for the San Lorenzo River restoration and beautification. And we have picked up our first time we did that. We got over 500 pounds of trash clean. Um, we've received awards from the county for Be the Difference Award from that. And we've held Two of those and we're actually coming up with our third one coming we paused due to covid but so my heart is very much dedicated and committed into this downtown space for my business for my own enjoyment for our community at largest enjoyment for children and their future enjoyment and so i'm here to 
provide what I can to support that process. And I would love to be considered to be put here. Thanks. Good timing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jenna Lee. Next, we have, I would like to invite Savannah Hartwell. And let me see if Savannah is here. Don't see Savannah. If you have a phone number, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Okay, I will move on next in alphabetical order. This is for the Downtown Commission Applicant Bub Radar. Bub, if you are here, please. Okay, I will move on. I do see Rafa Sonnenfeld. This is the final applicant for the downtown mission. You will be promoted to panelists. Where you are, welcome, Rafa. We'll have three minutes. Thank you for having me. Uh, good evening. My name is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Speaking now on behalf of my candidacy for an open seat on the downtown commission. I'm serving on a council appointed advisory body, which I had the honor to do in 2019 when I served on the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, requires resourcefulness and a dedication to open communication, as well as being able to synthesize community feedback and creativity when it comes to identifying solutions that are that work for multiple stakeholders with competing interests. These are all qualities and experience that I will bring to this role. Having capable leaders experienced in developing public policy is critical to the success and vitality of our downtown. I'm committed to bringing an evidence-based approach, open-mindedness, and responsiveness to help guide our city through some of the more vexing challenges we currently face, whether they be balancing the transportation and parking needs of downtown workers, shoppers, visitors, and residents, or helping our downtown businesses not just recover from the pandemic economic challenges, but thrive heading into the future, or meeting the needs of all of our members of our community downtown with access to adequate hygiene facilities and solutions to security and safety challenges. I'm proud to say that during my time serving on the catch, many of the policies I helped develop have been adopted by the city and become official city policy or programs. Serving in that role, as well as in others as a community organizer and resident of downtown Santa Cruz, I've had the opportunity to work closely and effectively with city leaders, um, elected leaders, planning staff, department heads, including those from our libraries, uh, Parks and Rec, police, and public works departments. I also have experience being a part of our working professional downtown community, um, having recently worked for the county managing the COVID-19 expansion shelter program at the Vets Hall, uh, working with some of the most vulnerable members of our community and being responsive to the neighboring businesses' needs. I've, um, are, are two qualities that, that uh, I've had in that role. I've also been invited to attend meetings of downtown Ford and form relationships with many advocates and leaders for the prosperity of our downtown community. In summary, I'll be a forward thinking commissioner who can hit the ground running with an understanding of the challenges we face today while having the experience, dedication, resourcefulness, and commitment to help our community, uh, both downtown and at large, uh, prosper and thrive for years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rafa. That concludes our downtown commission applicants. We will now move on to, it looks like the Historic Preservation Commission. I will um, go in alphabetical order. We had two applicants in this category, Don Lauritsen and Joe Mikola. As I call your name, please prepare yourself to be ready to speak. Dawn, you will be first alphabetically by last name. And I do see you, Dawn Lort, you will be promoted to a panelist. You will have three minutes. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, uh, I would like to be re appointed to the City Historic Commission. I've served on it the last four years. Or as a second choice, be appointed to the City Planning Commission. 
<clears throat> I've been the chair uh, of the Historic Commission for the last year. And I'm a retire retired city planner with a master's degree in urban planning and al have almost 40 years experience in planning. Been a local resident since 1992 and I'm very interested in the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz having good planning and historic. I concentrated in urban design and historic preservation during my work in the city of Santa Cruz planning department from 1994 to 2002. I was the department's principal staff for the city historic commission at that time for about 10 years. In that position, I was in charge of production and hearings for the volume three historic building survey document 2013 and also for associated ordinance amendments to make historic related permit requirements more user friendly. During that time, I handled permit review for numerous historic buildings, including the Falls Cannery on River Street, La Bahia Building on Beach Street, and the reconstruction of the St. George Hotel and Del Mar Theater buildings on Pacific. I also processed numerous sign design permits for construction of large buildings on Pacific Avenue, including the mixed use buildings at the former Bookshop Santa Cruz site, at the Pacific and SoCal corner where Forever 21 is now located, and at the North Pacific River Street condo complex, some retail also. I, I serve on the Friends of, Lime, Friends of Cal Lime Works Historic Board at UCSC and Museum of Art and History Landmarks Committee, which administer uh, the museum's historic uh, program. As you can tell, I'm very interested in historic preservation. Uh, thank you for your attention to, uh, tonight. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dawn, for taking the time to introduce yourself. Next, I will call Joe Nicola and invite him to speak. Welcome, Joe. You will have three minutes. Uh, there you go. Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Bruner and uh, fellow councilmen. My name is Joe Michalak, and I've served on the Historic Preservation Commission for the last four years, uh, serving as chair for two years and as commissioner for the last half. Um, my focus on the HPC has been public engagement and education and training. And with public engagement, I believe it's important for our community to really uh, give them a greater context for preservation, really develop their consciousness about preserving neighborhood character, uh, develop a sense of place, um, and uh, looking at all the significant elements that help build community. Uh, in terms of education and training, as you probably are aware, uh, the learning curve of the HPC is pretty steep. You, not only have to understand CEQA, the ordinances, you have to understand how the technical interior standards are applied locally and throughout the country. So uh, I focused on a considerable amount of training to understand uh, legal implications of preservation, as well as uh, uh, architecture, uh, public policy, and uh, areas of that nature. So. Um, that's uh, what I have to say. And I would think if you do or do not appoint me to the commission again, uh, I would just like to point out that my colleagues on the commission are uh, very helpful, very talented and capable people. And I appreciate it uh, certainly working with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. We will now hear from applicants who chose the Parks and Recreation Commission as their first choice of advisory bodies. As I call your name, please prepare yourself to be ready to speak. In alphabetical order, we have Bradley Angel 
Fuerte, Leonardo Cruz, Jane Leo, Dino Pollock, and Jacob Pollock. First up is Bradley Angel. Bradley, are you in attendance? If you are on a device, you can sign. Raise your hand. Okay, I will move forward to the next name alphabetically. Jorge Leonardo Cruz. Okay, are you here? I don't see Jorge. Okay. Next, uh, I have Jane Neo, and I do see Jane here. So, Jane, well, you will be promoted to panelist, and then you'll be able to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. <laughs> Hi, uh, welcome. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, greetings. Mayor, Una, and all your DCOMS members. So I want to thank you for reading my application. And I have an opportunity to give you my nutshell version of why I would love to be reelected uh, to the position of Park and Rec Commissioner. So, uh, Frankly, every fiber in me realizes that the park and uh, rec department add a huge improvement, tremendous rich experiences to our community's quality of life, as has been shown during the COVID situation. The city and park uh, open spaces off a wide array of diverse environments that allow for inclusive different recreational activities. And also the city staff build, the recreational uh, city staff builds community spirit with its class and events. So I view the park and open spaces as a city community treasure cared for by the entire, entire park and rec uh, staff. And it ensures that they make the impossible possible. Truly, they do. And so as a commissioner, it was really a huge privilege to be part of that team and striving for win-win situations for any of the issues that would come up. And I, I would be so honored to keep working on what I love, the community treasure, our park open spaces. And I thank you for all that you do for the Namaste. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you for introducing yourself to us and for your application. I will move and invite the next applicant, Dino Pola. Let's see if Dino is here. No Dino. Okay. Jacob Pola. I do see Jacob. Jacob will be the final applicant for the Parks and Recreation Commission. Welcome, Jacob. Okay, let's see. I got myself unmuted. Get me a video. See me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Jacob Pollock. I'm a father and a research ecologist and have been a member of the Santa Cruz community since 1988. I got my BA in at the UCSC Environmental Studies Department. I also got a PhD there through the environmental studies and the biology. I've been studying ecology and enjoying this uh, outdoor natural areas in Santa Cruz for many, many years. 
As a conservation biologist and a natural naturalist, I have knowledge and appreciation of the outdoor world that will be a strong asset in helping advise the park's protection. Um, also, as a father of twins, my family and I have used and enjoyed the park, the beaches, the open space, the pools, ball fields, biking and hiking areas, and classes. These services have literally helped me raise my kids to be compassionate, caring people. Parks and Recs does a wonderful work and helps make Santa Cruz a wonderful place to raise kids and improves our collective quality of life. I hope to work toward maintaining and improving all of these services. At this point, I have some time and would like to give back to the community that has helped raise my family so well. The Parks and Rec Department is probably the department I am most familiar with and most qualified to advise them. As an active community member, I have served on numerous nonprofit and educational advisory committees and boards. I've worked as an outdoor recreation leader, little league coach, volunteer ranger, and a volunteer naturalist. I've helped teach in the schools here, served on hiring committees, and interfaced with teachers and parents as a member of site. I am clear, thorough, and independent in my thinking. I listen well to others. and am able to come up with independent opinions and share compromises. My goals for this commission are mainly to help keep the Parks and Rec Department running smoothly, ensuring equitable access, and encouraging more people to use the wonderful facilities and open spaces we got. I would also like to ensure the restoration and conservation for the enjoyment of future generations. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, hearing me. I'm available if you uh, wish to talk to me or call me and talk to me, ask more detailed questions, et cetera. Okay, so much forward to decision. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jacob. Nice to meet you. That concludes our Parks and Recreation Commission applicants. We will now hear from applicants who chose the Planning Commission as their first voice of advisory bodies. As I call your name, please prepare yourself to be ready to speak. I think this commission had the most applicants. Alphabetically, we have Elizabeth Conlin, Candace Elliott, Pete Kennedy, Kenneth Matlin, John McElvey, Philip Meckes, Mark Mercedi Miller, Daniel Nelson, Ron Pomerant, Charles Prograce, William Schultz, Sarah Wickle, and Sean Williams. First up will be alphabetically by last name, Elizabeth Conlin. Elizabeth, I see you here. You will be promoted to panelist and then you will be able to speak. Welcome. We'll have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. I'm Elizabeth Conlin and hoping for the opportunity to serve Santa Cruz by joining the Planning Commission. Many of you know me through my involvement in local term housing group Santa Cruz EMB. I understand that serving on Planning Commission differs significantly from being a community activist. If appointed, I will be objective and seek to work with fellow commissioners to provide Council with the best possible recommendations on issues related to city land use policy. I believe that my activism reflects how much I care about our community, particularly housing affordability, and it has also given me familiarity with many local regulations and state laws that will be relevant to items before Planning Commission. Apart from my interest in housing and land use policy, I work as an agricultural researcher and have a master's in horticultural sciences. As a scientist, I have experience plunging into unfamiliar topics and I'm ready to read up on new topics and show up to commission meetings prepared with relevant follow-up questions for staff, applicants, and others. I hope to have the opportunity to serve and also to advance land use and building policies that align with your priorities, including affordable housing, equity, and climate resiliency. Thank you for your consideration. Wonderful, thank you so much, Elizabeth.
next, I have applicant Candace Elliott. I'd like to invite the Candace. Wonderful. Welcome, Candace. I just want to thank you all for having me and start out by saying what a wonderful group of candidates that you have to choose from. My family has participated in planning and construction in Central California for close to 100 years. My grandfather was the mayor of his hometown, and we continue to provide 30 units of affordable housing to farm workers. My father is a construction project manager and owner's rep and has been building in the coastal zone for more than 20 years. So I've grown up with planning and construction as a part of our dinner table conversations forever. I am a mother and I rent a home in downtown Santa Cruz and have been living in the county for about 10 years. My involvement in local issues began in 2013 with my position as the HR manager for the Glass Jar Restaurant Group. I started attending city council RTC and supervisor meetings on issues which affected my staff, including housing and transportation, specifically advocating for affordable and market rate housing, housing development at transit hubs, and enhancing transportation options between North and South County. I've been interested in serving on the Planning Commission for many years, but I wanted to spend some time working with local organizations and understanding issues before applying. So I worked on Measure H, the Affordable Housing Bond Measure. I've been on the boards of directors for Pajaro Valley Loaves and Fishes, the Homeless Garden Project, the Santa Cruz Downtown Association, the Santa Cruz County Business Council, and the Santa Cruz County Workforce Development Board. I was also the co-chair of the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, and I worked for the city and the Economic Development Department on a variety of issues affecting downtown, including um, the Property-Based Improvement District Project. I'm currently a small business owner and consultant, and I work with hundreds of local small businesses and nonprofit organizations on human resources systems development. That's what my master's degree is in, it's in human resources. Um, I understand that the Planning Commission will be reviewing and making recommendations on issues that will impact the development of our community for decades to come. And I believe in increasing density in already dense areas, preserving open space and farmlands, and improving infrastructure that supports everyone who lives here. And I hope that I represent the direction that you would like to lead or the direction that you would like to head and thank you for considering my application. Thank you very much, Candice. Thank you for your application. I will now call on Pete Kennedy to speak. Pete, I see you with your hand raised. You will be promoted to panelist and then you will be able to speak. Welcome. You have three minutes. Press star six to unmute yourself. That helps. All right, is that better? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, thanks for taking the time interview me. I uh, was served on the Planning Commission for eight years and was termed out for two. I'm really interested in getting back to the wonderful work that we did. We had a really good commission, built a lot of housing. Um, hard to say what I'm most proud of. I think it was our work on the EDUs that we did. Uh, we revised those three times over eight years. And each time the state came back, and said, do more, do more, do more, do more. So that's what I'm really looking forward to do, uh, doing if I were reappointed is uh, continuing that good work, building housing for our town. Uh, the last thing I wanna point out is uh, I do work in green building, clean energy, and I just really wanna continue to focus on uh, taking the amazing things we're doing on the scale of buildings, moving them to neighborhoods bigger and bigger as a way to solve this climate crisis. 
We are not getting out of this burning natural gas in single family homes. I'll tell you that as I sit here in my single family home for class. So uh, I just see planning and the climate uh, planning coming together here, both city planning and so thanks again for your time. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions and uh, I promise I'll get better at work soon. Thank you so much, Pete. Now I invite Kenneth Matlin. Kenneth, who will be promoted to panelist. You are here. Let's see if I can find you. If you are on a device, you can start trying to raise your hand. Kenneth, I do not see you. I will move on. Let's see, it looks like I will now call on Sean McElvey. For Planning Commission, Sean, are you in attendance? Sure, missing anybody. Don't see Sean. Next up, we have Philip Beckus, who I do see. Philip, you will now be promoted to panelists, so you will be able to introduce yourself and speak. You will have three minutes to speak. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Just having me and for considering me. Um, just want to say that I'm interested in this, I think, really because I've grown up here and I'm part of the generation that gets to live here, continue to live here. I have the opportunity to employ lots of people from the area as well as throughout the county to enable them part of their lives as they continue to grow. And I'd like to be able to see them stay to continue to be a part of this community. Um, I am a homeowner here, interested in preserving the character of the city, as well as just regardless. Enjoy listening, objective, learning, deliberating, coming to conclusions, and really just working for common good. If I have the opportunity to be a part of this, I'm excited to see what we can do, what we can accomplish to enable all Santa Cruzans to continue to be Santa Cruzans. Really just the best city opportunity for who's here, who ends up living here, hopefully to stay here. That's about all I have, and just thank you for considering my application. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Philip. Thank you for your time. I now invite Mark Miskiti Miller. Mark, you are here. Wonderful. You will be promoted to panelists. Be able to speak to your application for the Planning Commission. Welcome, Mark. Now you can see. Yes. Greetings, Mayor Bruner and fellow council members. First, I just want to say thank you for your service. I am well aware of the incredible sacrifices you make to lead our city and deeply grateful. I'm also grateful for the opportunity I've had to serve as a planning commissioner in the past, uh, serving two terms, twice being elected as chair. I'm also grateful for the opportunity to serve as a member of the Water Supply Advisory Committee. As a 39-year resident of the city of Santa Cruz, I know one thing, Santa Cruz is going to change. That not changing is not an option, that this change will involve growth. Growth will be a powerful tool if properly managed for shaping Santa Cruz into a better, more sustainable, more equitable 
more prosperous community that we all want Santa Cruz to become. I am a big fan of walkable, livable communities, active transportation, housing, especially affordable housing, transit-oriented development, and quality design in the built environment. I promise to give you, the City Council, the best recommendations and advice based on thorough review, rigorous analysis, and deep understanding of the issues brought before the Planning Commission. Thank you for considering my application. I would welcome the opportunity to serve the city again. Good night. Thank you, Mark. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. I will now call on Daniel Nelson. Daniel is here, I see. Yes, Daniel, welcome. You will now be promoted to a panelist. Getting the hang of this. Hello, Daniel. You will have three minutes to speak and introduce yourself. Unmuting. Sorry. Hello. Hi. Um, good evening, Mayor Brenner and Council. Um, thank you for considering my application. I'm currently serving on the Downtown Commission and have enjoyed the work. The last year we've collected in lieu fees for the first time, responded to the changing landscapes of the COVID pandemic, piloted a, par a popular parking program for downtown residents. I also enjoy learning about new projects coming on the downtown area. It's really an exciting time as we're looking to expand downtown to South Laurel, options for new and improved Warrior Stadium, stadium building a new library, building a I'm applying for the Planning Commission because I want to serve the community during this dynamic time of growth, work closely with council, staff, and the community to create a Santa Cruz that we are all proud of, that works for all of us. I'm excited to see what emerges from these projects, and how the city evolves over the next day. And I look forward to working with all of you to create a Santa Cruz that we all want. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much, Daniel. Next, we have Ron Pomerant. Ron is the next applicant in alphabetical order. If here, you are on a device, you can press star nine to raise your hand. I don't see Ron present. Next, I will invite Charles Prograce. To speak, I see Charles here. Welcome, Charles. Take a minute and then you will be able to unmute yourself and we'll have three minutes. Hello. Are you ready? Yes. We're here we ready. go. Hi, I'm Charlie Prograce. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. I appreciate your efforts that you guys are doing tonight and, and always. Um, I'm honored to have your consideration to serve on the Planning Commission. I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in Architectural Engineering, and I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of California, New York, and Texas. Um, I'm, the, I'm the principal engineer at R3 Consulting Engineers, a local engineering company that specializes in structural engineering for the past seven my office is located downtown at the corner of Pacific Avenue and Locust Street. Uh, we provide service to a multitude of local businesses and homeowners on commercial and residential pro projects. This experience has also taught me to be an effective listener, communicator, critical thinker, and collaborator with both clients and staff. In my personal life, I'm the father of two children, both of which were born and raised here. They're presently in college or will be in the fall. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time volunteering over their, over their uh, childhood. During that time, I served on a number of boards and coached baseball at San Lorenzo Valley High School. I learned a lot about, about what it means uh, to, to be a mentor and also 
um, understanding what it means to be part of this community. And, and it's important to me to be part of the fabric of our community and also uh, contribute to that. That's what brings me to wanting to be part of it. Um, so in summary, my experience with the experience of design and pet planning of buildings, understanding of building codes, understanding of the process of what it takes to construct buildings, um, a passion for architecture that's, that's, that's with me since I was in high school, um, coupled with uh, my volunteer efforts, I believe make me unique, uniquely qualified for the position. It would be my privilege to serve on the planning commission and and rest assured that I'll leverage every bit of my intellect and my experience on on your behalf. It truly would be a privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carly. Thank you, San Antonio. I will now call on William Schultz. Let's see if William is here. And William, if you are on a telephone device, you can press star nine to raise your hand. I don't see William, but I do see the next applicant, Sarah Wickle. I will now invite Sarah to speak for the Planning Commission. Application. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Bruner. Council members, can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you so much for having me this evening. My name is Sarah Weichel. I'm a 25-year-old resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I currently serve as an associate planner with the city of Watsonville, and I've had the privilege of living here for about the last five years. Um, I originally came to Santa Cruz to major in community studies at UC Santa Cruz. Um, my background prior to transferring, um, I was a board member for a affordable housing nonprofit that served at risk youth in Sonoma County. And that really exposed me to the affordable housing issues plaguing our region and um, encouraged me to kind of look for a degree program that would allow me to explore economic uh, health justice related issues that community studies does. And through that program, I actually worked uh, with the No Place Like Home Project for two years. Um, and I did background research that was funded to work on a, a community GIS mapping project for community resources throughout the county. Um, I had the fortune of attending a couple of uh, seminars at UC Santa Cruz, one of which was which with, with bleh, excuse me, sorry, uh, professor who used to be at UC Berkeley, she's now at the University of Toronto, her name's Karen Chapel, and um, she kind of blew my mind with thinking innovatively about the affordable housing crisis. And I was like, oh my gosh, planning, that's like what I want to do, that's my passion. So um, once I graduated from UC Santa Cruz, I moved to the city of Tracy, which is a very weird move. Um, my parents, as most young college students do, um, I moved back in with my parents and they relocated to the San Joaquin uh, County area because they got priced out of the Bay Area due to high cost of housing. And so I had the privilege of interning with their planning department. Um, they're dealing with thousand unit subdivisions, which is vastly different than um, the planning in Santa Cruz County. but it uh, laid the groundwork for me to come back to the county where I, you know, I reside in the city of Santa Cruz and I get to work with the city of Watsonville. And I think what makes me uniquely qualified for this position is I am actually the person who presents to planning commissions and city councils on zoning code and state law. And I uh, understand all of that information in <laughs> excruciating detail. Sometimes it makes me want to pull my hair out, but ultimately um, it would be an honor and a privilege to serve the city council in a advisory capacity. Um, I do understand the difference that I am not staff for you and I um, am serving in a political position and I um, am very excited to take that next step and uh, really try to bring a municipal planning perspective to the planning commission and look at projects from an equity perspective as I also did some organizing work um, as a college student with the student uni uh, Students United with Renters and um, worked a little bit on uh, the Measure M campaign. And so I, again, am excited to be considered for this appointment. And um, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very nice to meet you. So 
The last applicant will be Sean Williams. We'd like to invite Sean Williams to speak. I see Sean. Oh, Sean is present. Welcome, Sean. You will have three minutes to speak. Hey. Hello. Hello, there I am. Okay. Wow, what a great group of uh, applicants. This is amazing to, to hear all these uh, applicants speak. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to hear my story also. My name is Sean Williams. I've been part of the Santa Cruz community for over 50 years, and the more, majority of those years working and living in the city of Santa Cruz. I have experienced incredible changes in the city of Santa Cruz during my time, including rebuilding of Santa Cruz after the 89 quake. Throughout the years, I've, I've seen firsthand the important role the Planning Commission has played in advising the City Council on developing and implementing a strategic and responsible plan to maintain the integrity of the community and while providing support to the city of Santa Cruz's diverse citizens. I can bring valuable knowledge to the Planning Commission as a construction project manager. <coughs> Excuse me, I was a project manager as a project manager, I was able to revitalize downtown, including the renovation of Del Mar, and help implement sensible mixed use development. I understand urban development and zoning and the impact they have on communities. As a community member, I would bring valuable experience to the Planning Commission and help the City of Santa Cruz continue to develop and implement strategic and responsible general plan, urban development standards, and area plans. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, Sean. That concludes our applicants for the Planning Commission. Thank you all for speaking and introducing yourselves. We will now hear from applicants who chose the Sister Cities Committee as their first choice of advisory bodies. I will again go alphabetically by last name. As I call your name, please prepare yourself to be ready to speak. We have two applicants in this category, Andre Kika and Thomas Stelling. Andre, you, I see you, wonderful. Welcome. Looks like you will be promoted, there we go. And- uh, Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I seem to be having the same thing with the start video button missing. Maybe something to do with a new machine or something, I don't know. So I guess I'll just be talking like that. Okay. Now you're muted again. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, I'm, I'm on push to talk. Uh, so, yes, uh, hello, uh, my name is Andre. I am at Marie Appointment, uh, Sister Cities. I mainly deal with the Lushta, although I kind of help out with other committees where necessary. Again, not going to waste too much of your time. Uh, again, obviously, as you are aware, with the COVID situation, and especially with the Alushtas political situation, is certainly things have been very interesting. I was involved with Sister Cities since high school. I went on tours. I actually had the pleasure of visiting on an exchange with the Jazz Ambassadors. Uh, I do, yes, I play music a little bit, though that's not my priority. Uh, but... So, yes, uh, I would like the opportunity to continue our efforts to keep this relationship alive and hopefully grow it. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. Wonderful. Thank you, Andre. Next, we have Thomas Stelling. I'd like to invite Thomas Stelling, who is also seeking reappointment. Let's see if Thomas is here. Thomas, and if you are on your device, you can press star nine to raise your hand. We don't see Thomas. Okay. That concludes our applicants for Sister Cities Committee. I will continue on to the Water Commission. 
Let's see, as I call your name, please prepare yourself to be ready to speak. Alphabetically, by last name, we have four applicants. Ross, Albert, Diana, Alfaro, James, Mekis, and Garrett Ross. I will invite first Ross Albert. Ross, see if you're here. I don't see Ross. I will move on to the second name, Diana Alfaro. Diana, are you with us? I don't see you either. Okay, James Meckis. I see Jim Meckis. Jim. Welcome. There you go. Hello. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. James Meckes here, or Jim. I come with decades of water interest, plus WASAC committee participation, and four years previously on the water. So I understand the role. Uh, you have my technical background info. Uh, I'll add that I'm a resident. I was born here, and I'm also on a university advisory board for Cal Poly. Uh, let me start by saying that Director Rosemary Menard and the Water Department staff I've worked with are outstanding. Uh, Santa Cruz is one of only a few California cities with a water. That's because we have more complex water challenges than most other cities. Our per capita water usage is now among the lowest in the state. Yet because our supply is limited and very peaky, we regularly experience drought. Uh, climate change will likely make it worse, not to mention wildfire risk. So additional water will come from technical solutions, like the ASR system we're pilot testing for additional storage. Our Water Commission was created to provide independent citizen input and oversight, particularly of long-range planning. It should not be dominated by water industry people. After all, you wouldn't want PG&E friends and family overseeing their activities on the California PUC. You, you do want an independent. I understand technology, including water tech. I've engineered new technology, both mechanical and digital. And I'm good at explaining the benefits to non-tech people. I have provided independent, fact-based input and oversight. Um, Council sees this water financial report portal. Um, it's a good example of improving understanding. A small work group selected more meaningful data, Sierra Ryan, Linda Wilshison, and myself, but to improve transparency for commissioners, council, and public, I encouraged replacing a dense 12 column spreadsheet with visual graphs that provide clear perspective and key trends across four years. Why? Because our water is so variable. It's an example of improved transparency that's been well received. In Santa Cruz, we need a resilient and reliable water supply for our children, for our grandchildren. And that's my focus. So I ask that you please appoint me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Next, I will invite our final Water Commission applicant, Garrett Rolfe. Garrett, you will be promoted panelist. I see you here. Great. And then as soon as you are here, you will be able to unmute yourself and speak. You will have three minutes. Hello. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and council members. My name is Garrett Rolfe. I'm a licensed professional engineer. I grew up in Ben Lomond and graduated from San Lorenzo Valley High School and Cabrillo College. After graduating from Cabrillo, I transferred to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and obtained a Bachelor's of Science degree in Civil Engineering in 2008. 
I was hired by Masidi Miller Engineering in September of 2008 and have worked on hundreds of projects for the past 13 years. Some for the city, some for the county, some for private owners. Some of the projects I've worked on include Jack O'Neill Seawall at the end of 38th Ave, Coastal Rail Trail. We are providing structural design for this different segments. Segment seven, phase one, has won the 2021 Caltrans Excellence in Transportation Award for Intermodal Transportation, which is kind of cool. Um, I've worked on uh, the 2020 Pipelines Replacement Project for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. I was the construction manager for $1.3 million project. We filed the notice of completion with the county in September 2021. Current projects I'm working on include the Lompico Tanks Replacement Project, where I was construction manager, the $2.4 million contract. We're still getting closeout submittals from the contractor, so hopefully that will be recorded at the county very soon. I'm working with Caltrans on California Highway 9 Bridge Replacement Project. I'm working for the city on the Westcliff Drive at Chico Storm Damage Repair Project. We're actually going to have our pre-construction meeting tomorrow with the general contractor. And I'm starting to get submittals on the Quill Hollow Pipeline Replacement Project, where I will be construction manager for that project as well. The field of civil engineering has provided the opportunity to support my family and help the community by improving public infrastructure. When I heard about the tsunami on Saturday, I immediately contacted my supervisor to see how we could help the Port District. Even though the 49ers were playing on Sunday, I went to the harbor with two of my coworkers, formed a damage assessment for um, the Port District of the docks to try and get the docks open to the public as soon as possible. I look forward to participating on the Water Commission, and I promise to review staff proposals with a critical mind and ask questions for the benefit of the community and provide a technical point of view to the Water Commission as I'm a licensed engineer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Garrett. Thanks for introducing yourself to us. Thank you. And Thank you. That concludes uh, our applicants for this evening. I would like to give a very big thank you to all the applicants who have expressed their interest in serving on a city advisory body board. And I understand not everyone was able to be here this evening. Um, thank you to those that did share with us tonight. Council members may reach out if there are any additional questions um, before our meeting next Tuesday. I see Bonnie Bush, City Clerk, with her hand up. Do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. No, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to, um, I got the information that I didn't have earlier for Rebecca Rockham. Um, oh, okay. Her application, she applied for the Art Commission, the Historic Preservation, Part and planning. So those are the four commissions you would remove her application. Great. Thank you for that update. Uh, let's see if there are to the applicants, if there are any follow up questions from council members, um, we will be reaching out to you this week. And if not, otherwise, our clerk's office will touch. We'll be in touch with all of our applicants following appointments on Tuesday, January 25th. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>